Good. Uh, thanks uh, for inviting me uh, to give these lectures. Um, it's really great to be here. And that in these uh, three hours, we are going to see some of the uh, very first methods uh, that were proposed uh, to obtain uncertainties with neural networks. Uh, they are based on this uh, Laplace approximation. And uh, we are going to see that actually they work still very well in practice and they have, uh, they seem to be quite promising uh, to obtain accurate uncertainties. Uh, this is an outline, outline of the tutorial. Uh, we're going to have a brief motivation for the Bayesian approach. Uh, I'm pretty sure you have already seen a lot of uh, similar things during the uh, summer school, but it will be good uh, because this will be also uh, set, a, set the basis for, for the more advanced methods that we're going to see later. We're going to describe the Laplace approximation, how to apply it in Bayesian neural networks, uh, all that uh, at this stage at, up until point three is based on uh, quite some old work uh, from the 90s. And then we are going to see more stuff uh, that has been happening more recently. Uh, and uh, in particular, new approaches based on this Laplace approximation, techniques to make it scalable, uh, techniques to make it work well with uh, modern neural networks. And then we are going to see a case study on applying these methods to obtain uncertainty estimates for the reconstruction of uh, X-ray uh, images. So let's uh, start with the uh, beginning, some motivation for a Bayesian approach. Uh, we are going to think about this uh, problem of uh, classifying binary, uh, data, where we have two types of uh, classes. In this case, we have um, red points, blue points, and then we want to fit a, a linear classifier that separates this data. This is going to be a, a hyperplane specified by some weights W, uh, and we want this hyperplane to separate the data. And uh, a possibility would be this, this could be a, a, sep a separator that makes zero errors on our training set, on our training set. That could be an option, but there are actually many different hyperplanes here that could fit the data more or less the same, no? This one, uh, maybe this one, but maybe this doesn't look so good. No? <laughs> uh, if you had to choose a hyperplane to separate the data, maybe you wouldn't be choosing this one. No, it seems to be quite unlikely that it could work well uh, with the new data points that are not present here in the training set. Um, this is another one, another one. Uh, this one also probably is not so good. Uh, so in general, uh, yeah, this one probably looks a bit better uh, and maybe in principle, we could favor this one. Um, so what we can do is uh, instead follow a, uh, one second here, delete this. Um, so in principle, uh, we could uh, follow a Bayesian approach to solve this problem. And the idea is that we are going to place a prior on hyperplanes and this prior is going to be a, a multivariate Gaussian. It's going to have zero mean, so we don't have any clear direction associated to these hyperplanes initially. Uh, and then the covariance matrix is going to be uh, just the, the identity matrix times a scalar. So this is going to be um, just uh, not favoring any particular direction. So let me see if this works. Uh, this works, yeah. Yeah. So if you plot the contours of our Gaussian in the prior, uh, it's just a spherical Gaussian. It doesn't really favor any direction. No, when we generate samples from this Gaussian, it could be samples that fall here, fall here, fall here. And then the vector, W could have any direction. And this means that we don't favor any, any, any direction for, for the hyperplane. We can combine this prior that, uh, are, that is going to consider equally all the possible classifiers with a likelihood, likelihood function. Here, sigma is the logistic uh, function given by this expression. It's going to map uh, real numbers uh, given by this uh, product of W and the input feature X into a scalar. 
And this tells us on which side of the hyperplane the data is. No? Uh, when you multiply W with X, this is going to be positive if X is on one side of the hyperplane, negative on the other. And then we apply this uh, logistic function, sigma, to obtain some probability. The larger the value of uh, W times X, the farther X is from the uh, decision boundary given by the hyperplane. And then um, uh, the probability uh, given by sigma is going to be higher uh, in that way. No? So it's, this is sigma, and here we're we are just writing the probability of, of y taking class one or minus one. Uh, we're using a, a simple property uh, of sigma. Let me see if this works, uh, sorry. So sigma has this property that sigma of minus x is the same as one minus sigma of x, no? And then because we are multiplying by y, uh, which can take values one or minus one, then we are writing here just uh, the probability of y taking value one is just a sigma of wx, and the probability of y taking value minus one is one minus uh, the, pro the minus sigma wx. Anyway, this is the, the model. Uh, we are going to do Bayesian inference. We obtain a posterior distribution on the weights. And then when we make predictions, now we average over this posterior distribution. And what is going to happen is that now we are going to average over all the possible hyperplanes that are separating this data. And instead of considering just a single value of these uh, separating hyperplanes, which could be fitting the data well, but it could be not so good, no? Like these ones, for example, this one, you wouldn't probably want to make predictions with that. <laughs> uh, when you consider all the uh, separating hybrid planes and you weight each one by the probability of uh, fitting the training data, you will be averaging for across all these type of classifiers that are separating the data. Uh, and in the end, when you average the predictions of all these, you obtain a predictive distribution like this, no? Where, um, you still have like a separating uh, a decision boundary that looks much better than some of the ones that we saw is actually separating well the data. And something that is quite interesting uh, is that we have uncertainty in these regions. Far away from the data, the predictive probabilities, uh, for example, in this region is closer to 0 0.5. No, 0 0.5 would be the decision boundary shown in orange. Here, the probability of class one goes to one. Here, the probability of class one goes to zero or the probability of class two goes to one. Uh, and in these regions, you are closer to 0 0.5 because you are far away from the data and you have higher uncertainty. Um, if you compare that with the solution that you could obtain by finding just a point estimate of the weights, just uh, considering still the, the Gaussian prior, and finding a point estimate of the weights, you would obtain something like this. No? Uh, you just have a hyperplane uh, W given by your point estimate. Uh, and what happens is that now the probability of one class or the other just depends on the distance to the decision boundary in orange. Um, but far away from the data, the probabilities are more or less the same as when you are close to the data. And uh, this model is not really capturing uh, uncertainty in your predictions. And this means that if you get a new data point that is actually different from your training data and you have to make predictions for that data point, uh, you could make very confident predictions. Now, if your data point is, for example, in this region here, you would be quite confident that it's uh, class red, but because you are far away from the data, maybe the data point is not actually red and it could be different. In this case, the Bayesian approach is, is making more robust uh, predictions. Um, okay. <laughs> Good. Um, so all this sounds great, but uh, we run into problems when we want to implement this, no? Because we need to compute this uh, posterior distribution, which is given by the product of the likelihood and the prior, and uh, that's not going to be easy to work with. In particular, when you have to integrate with respect to the posterior distribution, we won't be able to do that exactly, and we will need to do approximations. 
Uh, you have seen some approximations uh, using variational inference in the previous lectures. We are going to focus here on a different way to do these approximations. And uh, what we are going to do is to approximate this posterior with a Gaussian in the same way as in variational inference, but the way we are going to fit this Gaussian is going to be different. We are going to use the Laplace approximation uh, for that. And uh, we're going to see now how to do that. <laughs> um, so what is this Laplace approximation? Um, this was a method actually proposed by Laplace uh, quite some time ago. And the main goal was to approximate integrals. You were going to uh, integrate with respect to some complicated function, for example, the one shown here in blue, and you're going to approximate it with a Gaussian that is going to be a more or less accurate approximation. Now, this thing is quite accurate here in the center and maybe not so accurate in the tails, but maybe because the function takes low values in the tails, then uh, the approximation is going to be good. Uh, so Laplace was using this for approximating any type of integrals. We're going to focus on approximating integrals with respect to probability distributions. And the, the approach is going to be to uh, approximate maybe this complicated probability distribution in, in orange here with a Gaussian uh, shown here in, in red. Um, and uh, we're going to do it uh, in simple models. Uh, I'm going to have some examples on one dimensional cases as this one. We're going to see another example of binary classification. And then we're going to use these same techniques to approximate integrals with respect to the posterior distributions of neural networks. Uh, also, I, I just want to say if there are any questions at any stage, feel free to, to interrupt. Um, good, so how does this Laplace approximation work? Uh, we have now some complicated target distribution and we want to approximate it with a Gaussian. Uh, the Gaussian has two parameters, the mean and the variance, and we have to choose some values for those parameters. Uh, let's assume that we are going to work with some posterior distribution, like this one is going to be given by the product of the likelihood and uh, the data. Um, let me remove this. Uh, the product of the likelihood and the prior gives a joint. The joint is some positive uh, function, but it's not normalized. You need to divide by this constant here to normalize it. And we are going to, to assume that there is like some function f, which is this uh, joint distribution, the product of the likelihood and the prior. This is not normalized, uh, and there is some normalization constant here set. And what we are going to do is to approximate this function f uh, with a Gaussian. Now, f could be this thing shown here in orange, and our Gaussian is this distribution q shown in red. We can choose the mean and the variance. To choose the mean, uh, one possible solution is just say, let's take the mode of my target. The mode is going to be the input W that maximizes F. And I'm going to make the mode of my Gaussian be the same as the mode of the target uh, as here. Um, the, two, the two have the same mode. Uh, let me see if this works. So this is the mode of the Gaussian and the mode of the target. Um, so that's easy. And finding the mode is going to be straightforward. We only need to do, we only need to do optimization. So we could run any numerical method to maximize uh, f of w. We could use gradient-based techniques. For example, we find some point at which uh, the gradient is zero but through optimization. And then that's going to be the mean of our Gaussian. So the mean M is the value of W that uh, maximizes this, this, uh, this uh, function F. That's good. We have a value for the mean, and now we need to choose a value for the variance. Um, so what should the value of the variance uh, be, uh, be, uh, be? Let's see. Uh, so we're interested in this. And what we're going to do is to do a Taylor approximation of F. We're going to do a second order Taylor approximation. So if we have our function F, uh, let's assume we want to approximate it doing some Taylor approximation uh, at the location A. So this is going to be the function at A. 
times the gradient, x minus a, and then here we have now one half, this would be the second derivative at a times x minus a squared. And then we would have, for example, here additional terms from our Taylor approximation. And so on. Uh, so we are going to do this Taylor approximation and take only the first two terms. The first two terms, um, the first one is going to be the value of f at the map solution. The second term is going to be the gradient of f at that uh, map solution, but that's zero, no? Because we already found a mode. So we can ignore that term. And then here we have uh, the second term, which is just the gradient of f, uh, the second derivative. Uh, and then we have here the quadratic term. I wrote this minus here uh, deliberately. Uh, let me see this one here, and then this one here. This is a deliberate because Gaussians are the exponential of quadratic functions. And these Gaussians usually have a, a, a minus sign here. Uh, so that's why I wrote it in this way. No? Um, otherwise, you could just write here plus and then plus. Um, so we have this second order, Taylor approximation to f. And now if you take the exponential on the left and on the right, uh, you take here the exponential of log f is f. And then the exponential of this thing is just f times the exponential of this quadratic function. And this now is a Gaussian, uh, it has a Gaussian form. Exp Gaussian distributions, the Gaussian density is just the exponential of a quadratic function. And that's what we have here. And what is interesting is that now in a Gaussian, typically you have a, a Let's see. So in a Gaussian, you typically have, um, for example, if it's a Gaussian on x with mean m and variance v, this is going to be proportional to exponential. And then here you have minus one half x minus m squared, and you are dividing by v. So we know that this is our inverse variance in our Gaussian. Um, and then our approximation Q, our Gaussian, is just a Gaussian with mean W map because we place the mode of our Gaussian at the mode of the target F. And then the variance is now the inverse of the negative uh, second derivative of our target function. Um, so that's, that's good. We have now a Gaussian, we know the mean and the variance. And once we know that, then the normalization constant of a Gaussian is very easy to obtain. No, the normalization constant of this Gaussian is going to be one over the square root of two pi times the variance. Uh, so if we want to normalize this approximation Q tilde, which is just a Q without a normalization constant, we can obtain the normalization constant very easily. We just have to integrate this. And this is just the, the, the result of this integral is the normalization constant of the Gaussian which is going to be the square root of two pi times the variance. And then here we have this extra term F. So this Laplace approximation gives us a Gaussian distribution that approximates the target, but also gives us an approximation of the integral of uh, uh, F. And uh, that integral, it's uh, the normalization constant in base rule is this thing here said is the P of D. And uh, this is going to be the probability of the data. And uh, we can use that to do different things. We could do that to do model selection. Uh, if you have, for example, different models, we could obtain the probability that each model gives to the data. And then we could use that to choose between those two models. We may have also hyperparameters. Like for example, we may have a Gaussian prior and we may want to choose the variance of our Gaussian prior. We could do that by optimizing this uh, quantity, the probability that the model gives to the data. And we will be able to do all these things with this Laplace approximation. We could take the Laplace approximation of the normalization constant, and then we could optimize that with respect to hyperparameters, for example, to choose uh, prior variances. No? We could take uh, this approximation here, 
and we could just uh, optimize that. Uh, and we are going to see later how to do that, uh, for example, in the case of uh, NIRA networks. Uh, good, any questions so far on this? No, yes, one question. Okay, so I guess the so the, the, your question is how this thing of approximating some distribution with Gaussians differs from minimizing the kullback leveler divergence. Is that right? Yeah. So obviously, there are many different ways to fit Gaussians to a distribution. There are many metrics that you could think of optimizing. Um, this one only looks at mode and curvature, and that's all the information that you need to fit this distribution. So in this simple example, if I just, uh, let me see if this works. So if, if I just know here where the mode is located and the shape of the mode, so I just know that it's located here, and that it has like a, a second order derivative, maybe like, like the curvature that it obtains at this location, that's all I need to do my approximation. So this is, uh, if you think about this, this is actually a very local method. It's only looking at this point, the mode, and looking at the shape that the distribution has there. If you think about other metrics, like the Kullback library divergence, that's typically going to look a bit more at the uh, shape of the distribution. You could think then that the Laplace approximation is very local and the kullback library uh, approaches based on minimizing the kullback library divergence, they won't be so local. Uh, you may think that the, then because of this, this Laplace approximation maybe is not so good. Uh, what we are going to see in practice is that it actually works way better than approaches based on the variational approximation. And we are going to get some intuition of why this is the case. Um, We'll see all, all this uh, in at, at a later stage. Good. Any any other questions? No. Cool. Let's see an, an example. Uh, just to clarify this, you have this distribution f. Uh, you find the input that maximizes it. Then you take the logarithm of f. You fit a quadratic function that has the same optima and the same curvature at the value w map and then you take the exponential of that quadratic function and that's going to be a gaussian it's uh, having the same height as the original distribution and the same curvature and the same optima and the same uh, uh, the same location of the optima and then i could easily normalize my gaussian here this is an unnormalized gaussian it's q tilde but i can normalize it very easily because gaussians are easy to normalize so this is the example in, uh, in 1D. Um, let's have a look at a more complicated case. Obviously, you, you don't want to work with one dimensional distributions. No, you want to work with high dimensional ones. So how does this work in the high dimensional setting? Uh, it's more or less the same stuff. Now F is going to be again, some joint distribution and now W is multivariate. We still have some normalization constant set here that is going to be hard to compute but we can take the log of f and do a, a Taylor approximation. And the Taylor approximation is going to be the same. The only difference is that now our quadratic function is a multivariate quadratic function. So now we have uh, w is a vector and it's multiplying, uh, it's, it, there is like some uh, location for, for our multivariate quadratic function for the optima w map. And then there is like a curvature matrix A. Um, and then there would be also another term here that depends on the uh, first uh, derivative, but that's zero because we have doing we have done the Taylor approximation at the mode. And then A is now the Hessian of our function F of the log of F. No, this is the second derivative. It's the matrix of second derivatives. So it's exactly the same thing. And now uh, we have a multivariate quadratic function. You can take the exponential of that. And that's going to be a multivariate Gaussian. And the normalization constant now of this 
is going to be depending on the determinant of uh, our uh, covariance matrix. So our approximation Q now is a multivariate Gaussian. The mean is a W map, the one that maximizes the target. And the covariance matrix is now uh, the inverse of the Hessian of the uh, log target uh, distribution F. So it's more or less the same stuff uh, as before. Uh, so just to clarify, if you have a, a multivariate Gaussian on W with mean M and variance V, then here we are going to have a normalization constant. This is going to be to be D. And then here we are going to have the determinant of V. There is going to be some square root. And then here we have just uh, the quadratic term. No, so we are working now with multivariate Gaussians. Um, and then normalizing the multivariate Gaussian is very easy. You just need to know what's the covariance matrix and then compute the determinant of that. And the determinant of the covariance matrix is the same as uh, one over the determinant of the inverse covariance matrix. Um, so that's it, a uh, multivariate case. We can see how that would work in the case of the binary classification problem that we saw at the beginning. In the binary classification problem, the log uh, unnormalized posterior would have this shape. Uh, there is like a mode here, and then it has this shape. Uh, and we are going to approximate this with a multivariate Gaussian. Our multivariate Gaussian is going to have the same mode. The mode is located at the same location. And now the curvature of this 2D Gaussian at this mode is going to be the same as the curvature of this distribution. This gives us this uh, 2D Gaussian that shows some correlation. We can see that it's more or less reasonable in this region here. Now the two look similar in this, uh, in this uh, region here. And this region here looks kind of similar. In these other regions, uh, on this side, uh, maybe the approximation is not so good, but maybe that's uh, okay, still okay. We can look at how this works in practice. We could say, let's look now at the predictions that our model would be making. And uh, um, they, will, they will be quite similar as we're going to see next. Uh, so, some math uh, showing how you would obtain your Gaussian in this 2D binary classification case. Uh, again, F now is likelihood times prior. The likelihood, the log likelihood is what we saw. The logistic function evaluated on Y times WX. And then here you have a Gaussian prior that is spherical. This is the, the, the original model that we saw at the beginning. And uh, to compute the Laplace approximation, you could find the map solution of this. You could do that using some numerical method, quasi Newton techniques, for example. Uh, you optimize this quantity. And then uh, once you have a W map, you could uh, try to find uh, the Hessian. Uh, the, minor, the, the, the second derivative of uh, minus log F. And if you do the calculations, uh, you could obtain this quantity. You know, the derivative of the log of sigma is one over sigma. And then you can use this property here that the derivative of sigma, maybe, sorry. The, the derivative of the logistic function is the logistic function times once minus, one minus the logistic function. And we already saw that one minus the logistic function is precisely the logistic function evaluated at minus x. So you could do that. And then if you take the derivative of the log of sigma is one over sigma, and then you have to multiply by the gradient of uh, sigma, which is this quantity and one over sigma time, times the sigma cancels out. So you end up only with uh, sigma of minus x. And then you have to compute the gradient of uh, w x and that's going to be uh, x, no? Because this is a linear function. The gradient of this with respect to w is just x. And if you do another gradient with respect to w, you are going to have now the gradient of sigma 
uh, with respect to X again, and that's going to be sigma times uh, sigma uh, evaluated to minus its input. And then you get another X coming out. So that's where you get this uh, Hessian here. And this is now the Hessian of this uh, quadratic term. Uh, so this is uh, very easy to do in this toy problem. Obviously, in more complicated models, uh, things won't be so straightforward. But at least we know what's the Hessian of our Laplace approximation, and then we could uh, obtain a normalization constant as well. Um, um, good. So let's assume we have already obtained our multivariate Gaussian. We have some uh, mean for our Gaussian, the map solution. We have our covariance matrix given by the uh, inverse Hessian of minus the log target. And then we need to solve this problem when we want to make predictions. Now, if we want to make predictions for a new input X star, we want to know what's the probability of Y star when we integrate out the weights in our binary classifier, we need to solve this problem. And this requires integrating with respect to the logistic function. So this is Gaussian, this is a logistic function. This problem has no analytic solution. Uh, so this thing here, uh, is no analytic. Uh, and this means we need to do approximations here. We are going to do an approximation that was also uh, used, uh, and we are going to use it later with the uh, neural networks. Uh, the idea is that the logistic function um, is actually very similar to the probit function. The probit function is the cumulative distribution of a Gaussian. And the two are actually very similar. What we are going to do is scale our uh, uh, probit function with some coefficient here, lambda. Uh, so that the two are very similar to each other. Um, this lambda is going to scale uh, the probit function. No, if lambda is zero, then all the inputs to the probit function are zero. And because it's the, this is the Gaussian CDF, it's going to be at zero is 0 0.5, no? For a standard Gaussian, the probability that uh, something is larger than zero uh, is just, uh, or smaller than zero is 0 0.5, no? So if lambda is zero, then this is just a straight line. And if lambda is goes to infinity, this tends to a step function. Um, so by changing lambda, we're going to change the slope of, uh, of this probit function. So we are going to be interpolating between these two solutions. Uh, let me see. So we have lambda equal to zero. This is just a straight line. Lambda equal to uh, infinity, then this is like a step function. And then for something in between, we'll have something smooth. Uh, and we want uh, this uh, probit function scale to be the same to have the same slope at the origin as the probit. And we see here when that happens that the two functions are very close to each other. Why we do this? Because actually integrating a Gaussian with respect to the probit has an analytic solution in terms of the probit function as well. I won't go much into the details of this. You have the solution for this in standard textbooks like a Bishop's book, for example. Um, but the idea is that if you have this uh, probit, times Gaussian integral is this quantity, and then you can just uh, approximate your uh, probit with the logistic function. And then this is now the integral of a logistic function with respect to a Gaussian. And that's uh, approximated with this probit. And we can also replace the, the probit with the logistic function using this, this approximation here in this, uh, in this part. No, we are just... Uh, mapping logistic to uh, probit to logistic and then logistic to probit. And uh, in the end, this is going to be our, sorry, this is going to be our approximation. Good. Um, let's see how we are doing on time. Good. So if we have our Gaussian approximation to the 
a posterior in the probit model in the in the in the logistic classifier model we make predictions now using uh, this uh, approximation now when we have a our posterior distribution on w times x is going to be some gaussian with some mean and some variance then we can plug it in that into this expression and then we get the the output the output probability is using this logistic uh, is there any question on this? No? Good. Uh, so this is the fun part. How does this work in practice? And it actually works really well. Uh, this is the same problem that we saw at the beginning. Uh, we have the data here. We have found some uh, map solution using some uh, numerical optimization method. We have then obtained the, uh, the curvature, uh, obtained the, the Hessian of the log target uh, and the, the inverse of that is going to be the posterior variance of our Gaussian here. To make predictions, we integrate with respect to that Gaussian with mean W map, uh, covariance matrix, the inverse of uh, minus the, uh, the Hessian. Um, and then we use this approximation of integrating a Gaussian with respect to logistic function is approximated by a logistic function with some extra terms that come here, these extra terms, uh, this is going to increase uncertainty. Uh, now this is, a, this is the same as in the map predictor. So that's the same. If we just find a point estimate of the weights and you make predictions in your logistic classifier, you could fit as input this to the logistic function to make your predictions. But now here we have these extra things that uh, uh, represent our uncertainty. We have the product of the feature vectors times our covariance matrix, and that creates uncertainty. And in general, uh, that extra uncertainty is uh, reflected uh, in these regions here. Uh, so in this uh, in this region here and this other region here, and when you compare with the exact solution, which uh, I have obtained here using Monte Carlo, uh, it's actually very accurate in this case. So in this simple problem, it provides very accurate uh, approximations. This is a problem where the model is linear, uh, and we are going to see uh, that actually there is a lot of connection between these methods for linear models and uh, the Laplace approximation in neural networks. We are going to see that uh, uh, next. Good. Uh, any questions so far on this? Yeah. Only the likelihood. Um, yeah, that's something that you could do. And uh, it would actually be almost the same. It would be almost the same. Um, it would be very similar, at least in terms of the Hessian. If you think about the Hessian, uh, let me see. Uh, so this thing here, uh, This could be the, the Hessian of the likelihood. Uh, and if you see, this is the, so A is also the, let me see, this A is also the inverse covariance matrix. So if you have two Gaussians and you multiply those two Gaussians, what happens is that the inverse variance of the product is the sum of the inverse variances. And uh, what is going to happen here is exactly the same. You are going to have that the, the, the Hessian of your approximation is the same. Uh, with the map, maybe there is going to be things that are not going to be exactly the same because you will have just a maximum likelihood estimate of the weights, and then you will have to, to combine that with the, with the prior. So the, the, map, the map solution might not be the same, but the Hessian is the same. But then the question is, why, why don't you just use the, the map solution directly? <laughs> so, of that. 
So I think that's why people don't do that uh, in practice. Cool, that's, that was a very good question. Uh, any other questions so far? No? Cool, uh, yeah, one question. Can you repeat this? Uh, the 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 frequentist uh, assumes some Gaussian. Okay, asymptotically, as you have more and more data, the point estimate that you obtain for the weights is is going to be more or less Gaussian. Uh, yeah, that's right. I think you can. Yeah, uh, I'm not super sure on this, but probably you can show that the. Uh, this point estimate for the weights uh, that you could obtain uh, would be the same as with the Gaussian approach. Because, I mean, the Gaussian approach in the end, the prior is going to, you can you will ignore the prior, no, asymptotically, as you have more and more data. And then everything will be driven by the likelihood. And then uh, the, at least in this, within the, with this approach, then uh, you will look at the curvature of the likelihood and this curvature of the likelihood is the same that is used for 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 the Gaussian that you mentioned, no, with the with the weights. So probably the two things are the same. Cool. Uh, so we are going to see now how to do this now with neural networks, uh, and it's when when things become more fun. Uh, the first person that was applying this Laplace approximation to neural networks uh, was uh, David Mackay. Uh, and he actually came up with this uh, set of techniques for his uh, PhD thesis. Uh, David Mackay's PhD thesis was mainly about how to obtain uncertainties in neural networks using this Laplace approximation. And then he also showed how to do model selection with the uh, model evidence and uh, other things. And this is a figure from his thesis showing a, a very simple data set. This was <laughs> to get an idea, this, this this is from the 90s, and this would be kind of the type of data sets that people were looking at that time. Uh, and they, he was showing how you can obtain uncertainties uh, by using this technique. And at least in this case, they seem to be quite reasonable, uh, the uncertainties that he was getting. David Mackay also, he's well known for being the, the author of this book, Information Theory, Inference, and Learning Algorithms. This was a reference uh, textbook for machine learning uh, in the past, I think it's a still a reference textbook. Now you have more modern books, but this is still like an amazing book and I, I recommend everyone to, to look at this. Um, he also was an author of another book, uh, which is uh, not related to machine learning. It's about a, a sustainable energy. And David Mackay had an, a big impact in uh, uh, raising awareness about climate change uh, and the uh, uh, formalizing the, the study of, uh, of, of different sources of energy and how they could be combined to, to tackle climate change. And he had, a, he had a big impact also with this. Uh, he was also an advisor for the UK government on, on these issues. Uh, anyway, David Mackay, he was great. He did many amazing contributions. And today we are going to see how he developed these techniques to, to do this Laplace approximation with neural networks. So the setting that we are going to follow is more or less the same as before. We have some inputs X and some outputs Y, uh, and we're going to solve, in this case, we are going to focus on regression, although the same techniques, uh, we're going to see that they can be applied to classification as well. So we have some targets Y, some inputs X. Uh, the likelihood is going to be in this case Gaussian. We assume that there is some uh, Gaussian noise at the output of our neural network. The neural network receives inputs X as input, has some weights W, and it generates some output. Uh, the parameter beta here, in this case, beta is the uh, noise precision. Um, and the, we have also a prior on the weights with some uh, uh, inverse variance uh, shown here. Uh, let me see, so we have here. So the covariance matrix of the noise is going to be alpha minus one, the identity. 
So it's just a, a, a Gaussian prior with zero mean and this uh, particular prior variance. Uh, and alpha is, is the, the prior precision parameter. Uh, you have this model, uh, the posterior distribution for the weights in our neural network is then uh, given by this expression, the log is going to be the log likelihood here. And then we have the log prior plus some constants. Uh, so we can apply the same techniques as before. We could just say, let's try to find a point estimate of the weights, uh, map a solution for W and then apply our uh, Laplace approximation there. So we only need to, to compute the Hessian and it's more or less the same uh, approach. Um, so we find some map solution W for the weights and we're going to approximate the posterior with a Gaussian with mean W map. And now the covariance matrix is just uh, the inverse of the Hessian of the log likelihood. And the Hessian of the log likelihood uh, comes up as just uh, the Hessian of the likelihood plus the Hessian from the prior, which is just lambda i is the inverse prior variance. Um, we can then uh, approximate the model evidence, the normalization constant as before. Before we said that uh, said was approximated as uh, uh, f w map. And then here we had some uh, determinant of a, I think minus one half or so. Uh, so here we are doing the same. This is now with logs. So the log of the model evidence is the log of the log posterior evaluated at W map. And that's going to be here, this term. Uh, all this comes from the log posterior. Uh, this is also the log posterior coming from the prior. No, and then we get also this extra term, uh, which uh, uh, comes from the normalization constant of our Gaussian. Uh, so it's more or less the same stuff as before. We have only replaced the, the likelihood now by the likelihood of our neural network. Um, this thing is going to, when you look at this uh, approximation, approximation of the model evidence, you have this term that favors the feed of the data and you have these other terms that are going to penalize complexity. So these extra terms are going to favor, uh, so this, this favors our neural network making uh, small errors in the predictions. This is going to favor uh, the neural network to have a small value for the weights that is going to uh, favor the, the output of the network to be more smooth. And then this thing is going to look at the curvature of the posterior and it's going to favor solutions where the posterior is more flat. And that's going to be good because uh, it means that uh, more different values of the weights are going to describe better uh, the data. Uh, and if you just uh, find some particular setting of the weights that fits data very well, but as soon as you change a small amount, uh, those weights, maybe the, the, the network doesn't fit the data, then that's not going to be so good. Um, so in general, you could do this to do model selection. You could compare two neural networks and see which one has higher model evidence. And the, the one that has higher model evidence is probably going to perform better because if it fits the data more or less the same as another one, but the, the log posterior is more flat, it's more likely to, to perform well at test time uh, on new data. Um, good. Uh, so there are some questions when that come that comes to mind when one wants to apply these approximations in neural networks. The first one is that when we saw at the beginning, um, so we are approximating something that looks more or less like a Gaussian with a Gaussian. No, so we have here something that looks like a Gaussian, and we approximate it with a Gaussian, and one could. In, Imagine that if your true this posterior distribution is very different from a Gaussian, maybe this Laplace approximation is not going to be so good. No, it could be that your true posterior has something like, maybe it's something like this. And maybe if I find a mode here and I find, fit it with a Gaussian that has the same curvature, maybe my approximation is not going to be so good. Uh, Neural networks are well known for having very complicated posterior distributions. The question is, 
why we would expect this Laplace approximation to work well in the case of neural networks. Yes. Yeah, there is a Gaussian prior, but I mean, it's, it's So you, you say that just because you have a Gaussian prior, you should use a Gaussian approximation? No, this is the, the posterior. So that includes already the, the prior. <laughs> this could be the, this, this complicated thing is, is already including the prior. Um, we're going to, to answer this question later. Uh, we're going to see why this uh, Laplace approximation makes sense in the case of neural networks. And, and in, in principle, one, we wouldn't, one wouldn't really expect it to work well in that setting. Uh, we are going to see that actually it doesn't work well. The Laplace approximation actually, if you apply it directly to neural networks, is awful. It works really bad. But there is a small detail that makes it work extremely well. And we are going to see what is that that, that makes it work so well. Um, good. Uh, so that's it. Then... Um, the other thing that David Mackay had to do at the, his time when he was working with these methods is to make predictions. Before we showed in the linear model that you had to integrate the logistic function with respect to a Gaussian. And that was not a analytical and we had to come up with some approximations. Now our predictions require to integrate uh, with respect to a Gaussian. Now here we have to integrate the predictions of our neural network here with respect to some uh, posterior distribution. And we're going to approximate this posterior with a Gaussian, which is what we are doing here. But we still have to integrate the predictions of our neural network here with respect to a Gaussian. That's not analytical. You don't have a closed form solution to do that. So David Mackay had to come up with an approximation for this. And what he proposed, it's something very simple. Um, if I have a Gaussian random variable, any linear transformation of that Gaussian random variable is going to be Gaussian, and it's going to be analytic how to obtain the mean and the variance of that Gaussian. So what he thought is, okay, you can approximate your neural network now linearly around uh, your map solution, and you will obtain a linear model the linear model is just the, the output of the neural network at that location. Uh, and then you have now some gradient of the predictions of the network uh, with respect to the weights evaluated at the map solution. And then you multiply by, by this. So this is just a first order linear approximation to the output of the neural network. Uh, we are going to call that this uh, F, uh, F tilde. And we are now going to replace that in our uh, predictions. Now I have the integral of a Gaussian with respect to uh, the output of a linear model. Now this is now a linear model on W. Now the random variable here W appears here and this is a constant. So it's just a linear model and integrating this now is exact. Now if I know that W has mean a w map and some particular covariance, I know that the mean of uh, w uh, is going to be w map, and this goes to zero, and I end up only with this term that appears here. No? So my mean, my predictive mean, is just uh, the predictions of the neural network. No? So this is, this is the integral of a Gaussian, and then a linear model with some Gaussian noise at the output, and the, the mean of my predictions then is just the mean of this linear model with some random weights, uh, which is just the, this term here. Uh, and then the variance is going to be the noise variance in my linear model, beta minus one, plus the randomness that comes from W. And the randomness that comes from W is just uh, given by its covariance matrix, A to the minus one, and then this uh, constant that is multiplying W here, the gradient vector. No? So that's why I have the gradient vector here multiplying on both sides. Um, so this gives me an analytic solution to the predictions of this uh, uh, 
Laplace approximation in neural networks. Uh, the mean is just uh, the mean of the map solution in the neural network. So it's the same as my point estimate. I find a point estimate of W and the predictions of my Bayesian neural network has the same uh, value as mean as, as the, the ones obtained in a deterministic neural network. But now I get some uncertainty uh, given by these uh, extra terms. Uh, and the advantage of this is that uh, now the mean is the same as in the map solution. This can be also useful because you could think about coming up with uh, new neural networks and maybe new training techniques. And by using this Laplace approximation, I guarantee that my Bayesian version of those neural networks will make the same deterministic predictions if I ignore uncertainty as, as the original neural networks. Uh, and then this extra term is going to look at uh, just uh, how well the gradient on new data points align with uh, the directions of low curvature. Maybe I won't get much into the details of this, but, but that's kind of the idea of, uh, of how you make predictions now in this setting. Um, and then how does it work? It actually works great. It works really, really well. Uh, so this shows uh, some predictions in some toy problem. Uh, and you see that the data is, I mean, the neural network is fitting the data quite well. The blue line is actually the same as in the, the deterministic neural network. If you ignore uncertainty and you just find a map solution of the weights, the prediction would be the same. And you get high confidence bands given by the uncertainty in regions where you don't have data. And the, the same here in another neural network. Uh, so this is amazing. No, you have this. Uh, complicated neural networks with very complicated posteriors. You're just finding a Gaussian approximation to the uh, posterior distribution, and then it makes uh, amazing predictions, uh, which is surprising. <laughs> um, the question is, why would be the case? Uh, you could say, uh, why is, is, is this actually working so well? And there is one very important thing that David Mackay did that makes all this thing work. And that important thing is this linearization of the network to make predictions. This linearization that we are doing here. This is actually key to make this method work. You could imagine, forget about the linearization. You could, uh, that's something that David Mackay could have also done, no? You could approximate this uh, integral here, the integral of the predictions of my neural network with respect to the Gaussian, you could have approximated that by Monte Carlo. It's very easy to sample from a multivariate Gaussian. And uh, you just draw a few samples, and then you just maybe, I don't know, 20 samples or so, and then you just approximate this by Monte Carlo. David Mackay didn't do that. Why? Because it doesn't work. It works horribly, horribly bad if you uh, do that. And uh, this is something that Neil Lawrence actually did uh, in his PhD thesis. Uh, and if you are familiar with Neil Lawrence, he has done a lot of amazing work in, in the area of probabilistic machine learning. He, he came up with uh, uh, deep Gaussian processes, uh, uh, Gaussian data and variable models, and many, many, many interesting contributions. He has worked a lot on Gaussian processes, variational methods, and so on. He was a PhD student uh, with uh, Chris Bishop, in Cambridge, and in his PhD thesis, he looked at Bayesian neural networks. And he actually has some of the first uh, variational inference methods for neural networks in his PhD thesis. And the first thing he did was, okay, I have variational methods, let's, let's compare with uh, the Laplace approximation. And uh, he had this toy problem, like this one, and you see in the, uh, in dotted uh, line, I think this is the prediction of, of a deterministic neural network. Uh, and you can then apply the Laplace approximation in this setting, and you can generate samples from your weights. And you could look at what the prediction of those samples would look like. And those samples are these, uh, these continuous lines here. It's horrible. <laughs> the mean of those predictions are actually this uh, black line here. They don't even fit the data. It was horribly bad. Um, why? He was not doing the linearization for predictions, which is what David Mackay was doing. Uh, 
Um, so it turns out that this linearized uh, approximation when you make predictions is key to make these methods work. And uh, we're going to see later why this is the case and I will get more insights uh, on this. Uh, I can tell you a bit why what's going on. Um, so you could imagine this is the, the loss. So it's, it would be like the log posterior with the sign flipped. So going down is good now. It gives you high, high log posterior values. And you could imagine that this is the map solution that you found. Uh, you could fit this with a Gaussian, which is going to have the same curvature as the log posterior at that location. And what is going to happen is that this log posterior is uh, not very smooth and it can change quite quickly. And it could go up quite quickly, as in this case. And what is going to happen is that if you do small changes to your weights, maybe you get into regions where the network actually doesn't even fit the data. And this is what was happening uh, to Neil Lawrence. He was sampling from the Gaussian. The samples of the Gaussians were moving away from the map solution, and they were getting into regions where the, the fit to the data was very poor. Uh, so, uh, a lot of mass of this Gaussian approximation falls into regions of low posterior density, and then your predictions are going to be poor. Uh, and then when, whenever you sample and your sample falls into these regions, then things are not going to work. Why is the model with a linearized approximation working better? Why, why using this linearization to make predictions is working better? What happens now is the linearized model doesn't change abruptly. It's just a linear model. No, it just has uh, the least possible amount of variation. Now, if you think about fitting the, uh, just fitting this term here, you're just fitting it with a linear model. No, so that's going to be just a, a, an approximation to the true likelihood here, but that is that changes very smoothly. No, it's just a straight linear model. Uh, so then. Uh, the linearized predictions don't really change so rapidly as the predictions of the original neural network. And that's going to make uh, the predictions uh, work better. Uh, this is some intuition, but we're going to see later more justifications for why uh, using this Laplace approximation with this uh, linearization for predictions uh, is a good idea. Uh, good, any questions so far on this? Good question. Yeah, that's a very good question. And the answer is yes. So for each new data point for which you want to make predictions, you will need to go and obtain this uh, uh, sorry. You will need to compute this gradient here. So that means that on each on each data point, you will need to we will need to compute a gradient. This will be like a backdrop step, and obviously this is going to have some cost. Uh, that I'm I'm not describing here the cost of this, but uh, there are some some costs that are considerable when you implement these methods. Yes. Um. I think that would introduce a lot of uh, errors because you would have uh, the errors will accumulate. So you will you could imagine of linearizing each layer and then things things could accumulate. Um, I'm not really sure. Maybe it's it's the same. Maybe it's the same. If you linearize the uh, if you linearize the uh, I mean you could do that. Um, yeah, I think you could do that. Uh, and it could maybe give you like, I think maybe, I don't, I remember maybe I read some paper that was proposing something like that. But yeah, that's something that you could do. Um, yes. Uh, Yes, you could think of doing that. Probably it would improve things uh, if you want to do to use the original network for predictions. 
uh, probably it would do it, it would improve things. Um, important sampling also can have high variance, so you have to be careful <laughs> with that. Uh, yes, the other question. Uh, no, it doesn't matter. Uh, I mean, this you could apply the same techniques to any uh, model. The fact that the ReLU is piecewise linear, um, I, I think maybe it, I, I don't think it gives you any any extra thing. This thing also works well with the uh, tan H. I mean, this was actually done with uh, this. This thing is with uh, tan H nonlinearities. Uh, good. One more question. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so this one, no? Uh, yeah, so one thing with this method is that uh, there could be multiple local optima, no? And you will be finding some point estimate of your weights and you will end up in some solution. And maybe that was not the best solution. Uh, I mean, that can happen. Uh, I don't think there is much you can do. People, when they train, I mean, the, the, my answer to that is when people work with point estimates of neural networks, they don't care about that much. Uh, we don't care about much either. Good. Uh, I think that's all. Then uh, let's uh, move quickly into some things. Another thing that David Mackay did in his thesis, and that was extremely, he was extremely successful. He actually was able to tune now hyperparameters uh, by optimizing the model evidence. And these hyperparameters were, for example, the prior variances. He was able to optimize different values of the prior variances. And uh, before, people didn't have like a very good way to do this. They didn't have a good way to do hyperparameter tuning. Maybe you could do hyperparameter tuning of a single prior variance uh, by cross-validation using some grid search or so. But David Mackay had this uh, expression for the model evidence. And he could actually optimize that with respect to many different prior variances. He could have prior variances across different uh, inputs or even across different neurons. Uh, and uh, what he did was to uh, use these techniques in some uh, machine learning competitions. He was able to fine tune the prior variances in uh, different uh, neurons in the neural network. And he actually obtained very good prediction performance in some problems. And he won uh, some machine learning competitions using, using these techniques. Uh, so that was another contribution of his thesis. He showed how to tune hyperparameters optimizing the, the estimate of the marginal likelihood. We are going to see quickly how uh, you could do that in practice. And he, he describes some methods that actually work very well. So the approximation of the model evidence is given by this expression is the log uh, posterior evaluated at the map solution plus this extra term from the, the log of the uh, determinant of the Hessian. Uh, and you could think of trying to optimize this with respect to our hyperparameters, the prior precision alpha and the uh, noise precision beta. We're going to see this. The first thing that comes to mind to someone is, OK, we have this expression. Uh, let's try to optimize that with respect to alpha. We can compute gradients and set those gradients to 0. And then we can just uh, improve the, the uh, model evidence by doing that. So we can try to do that. Uh, we can try to compute gradients of this quantity here with respect to alpha. And more or less, everything is a straightforward. This thing doesn't really depend on alpha, so we can ignore that. So this thing, for example, here doesn't depend on alpha. This doesn't depend on alpha. And then here we have one term, and then here another term. Uh, so the gradients of these two things are straightforward. Uh, and then here we have this other thing that depends on alpha, because alpha is the prior precision. And we saw the Hessian here. So the Hessian depends on alpha here, no? Uh, and we have to account for that when we compute gradients. So we need to compute uh, those gradients. We are showing it here. We need, 
we need the gradient of this log determinant. And the, the determinant is the, the, the product of the eigenvalues of a matrix. Uh, so we can uh, assume that this lambda i plus alpha are actually the eigenvalues of the Hessian uh, A. Uh, and then the log of the determinant is just going to be the sum of the log of the eigenvalues. Now, if the determinant is the product of the eigenvalues, the log of the determinant is the sum of the log of the eigenvalues. Uh, the eigenvalues are going to be alpha plus the eigenvalue from the log likelihood, no? Because of the, if you look at the, the Hessian here, you have this thing that comes from the log likelihood and then this, this, this alpha times the identity, no? So when you add alpha times the identity, you are just adding alpha to all the eigenvalues of the log likelihood. So the eigenvalues of A are going to be the eigenvalues of the log likelihood plus alpha. And that's what we have here. Uh, uh, so that's fine, we have that there. And we have to compute the gradient of this with respect to alpha. The gradient of the log is one over the quantity. Uh, and then the gradient of alpha is just constant. Uh, so this is now the sum of one over these eigenvalues and uh, one over the original eigenvalues are actually the eigenvalues of the inverse matrix. No? <laughs> if you invert uh, a, a symmetric matrix, the uh, eigenvalues of the inverse are just one over the eigenvalues of, of the matrix. Uh, so this is just the, the eigenvalues of the inverse matrix, and we are summing all of them, and you can show that that's the trace of that matrix. Um, Anyway, so you just have an expression there for this gradient. There is one critical thing that we did here. Uh, and uh, we have assumed that these eigenvalues, lambda i, don't depend on alpha. And uh, uh, that's wrong. Um, because they depend on alpha through the uh, map solution. No, because we obtained if you think about the matrix uh, A, A is going to be this thing evaluated at the map solution. And we obtain the map solution optimizing the log posterior. And that log posterior includes a prior term that depends on this alpha. No? So uh, this W map depends on uh, alpha and then uh, the eigenvalues of the log likelihood depend on alpha. What happens is that that dependence is actually very small and you can uh, kind of ignore it and everything works very well. Uh, and that's that's what David Mackay did in his thesis. Uh, so he came up with this formula that you obtain when you uh, compute all these gradients and then uh, solve for the gradient being equal to zero. You can find that the solution is alpha equal to gamma divided by this uh, dot product between uh, the, the weight value for the map solution. Uh, the quantity gamma is actually super interesting. Uh, it's, a, it's a quantity that represents uh, the, I think we have it here, uh, the effective number of uh, well-determined parameters in our neural network. So this quantity gamma is just uh, these eigenvalues of the log likelihood divided by the eigenvalues of the log likelihood plus alpha. And what is going to happen is that if some direction in our loss function is uh, uh, very flat, uh, this eigenvalue is going to go to zero. And then uh, when you are summing over the dimensions here, that means that there is one dimension that doesn't really contribute much to your point estimate of the weights. Sorry, one second. Um, so there is one dimension that doesn't really contribute much. Uh, and uh, let me put this inside and point one second. Um, so if there is one dimension that doesn't really contribute much to your, to your loss function, it means that uh, there is some parameter there that is not really that useful. Um, and it could be that then the eigenvalue of the log likelihood is very large. And this means that there is like a high curvature across that dimension in your log likelihood. And this means that 
If you change a slightly a particular weight, then the predictions of your neural network or your fit of your neural network to the data is going to change a lot. That means that that parameter is quite tight and you cannot really change it much. Uh, and when, when this lambda i goes to large values, because you have lambda i in the numerator and in the denominator, this goes to one. So basically, when you have dimensions that are quite tight and well determined by the data, you count one. And when you have dimensions that are not well determined by the data, you count zero. And in the end, this gamma represents the effective number of well determined parameters in your neural network. And uh, uh, that has like a very good and, and intuitive interpretation. And this thing recall that alpha is the noise, is the prior precision. It's like the inverse of the var prior variance. It's the inverse of the prior variance. And here, what we are going to do is just summing the square of the weights. And now we are dividing instead of by the total number of weights by the effective number of uh, well-determined parameters that is going to reduce uh, potential overfitting problems. Um, but anyway, it's, there is like just this in, intuitive interpretation. Uh, uh, the right value for the prior variance is going to be determined by the sum of the squares of the point estimates of the weights that you found, but now divided by this effective number of uh, well-determined parameters. Uh, so uh, imagine that, uh, yeah, imagine that the, the, your data doesn't really say much. If, if your data doesn't really say much or your parameters are kind of loose and then gamma is going to be close to zero. Uh, and this means that the noise precision is going to zero. And then it means that your prior variance should be larger. This means that there is no, uh, your data is not really saying uh, much. Uh, uh, so you could have like larger prior variance in that case. Uh, Anyway, you could do the same with uh, the noise precision beta. We won't go much into the details of this, uh, but you could obtain a similar expression um, for that. And it also depends on this parameter gamma. It's basically the noise precision is just the empirical sum of squared residuals, but now uh, you don't count the total number of those squared residuals. You just count, uh, you, you just subtract here uh, gamma. Uh, how does it work in practice? Uh, there are some papers, and this, this could be uh, interesting to, to see. So this is a, one of the, the papers showing the implementation of this in practice to do hyperparameter tuning. This is a paper from 1997. The neural network that they were considering, how many hidden units do you think it had? It's, it's written there. It had six hidden units. <laughs> so it had this... Uh, this is a neural network with six, six hidden units. Uh, they tried it on this uh, data set. Uh, it's just like this uh, triangular function with some noise. Uh, if you fit your neural network without tuning the hyperparameters, it's overfitting. It has only six hidden units, but it's still overfitting. <laughs> they were also training these neural networks with uh, quasi-Newton techniques. So they were actually doing much stronger optimization than than people do now. No, now you do stochastic optimization. But you can see here that it's, optim it's overfitting. And when you do hyperparameter tuning, actually it doesn't overfit. And it gives you like a very nice uh, solution. Uh, so yeah, this actually works very well in practice uh, to do the hyperparameter tuning using this technique. And it actually controls very well for overfitting. It's going to choose the, the right uh, variance on the prior. Uh, one question. I I'm I couldn't hear very well your question. Can you speak uh, louder? Yeah. 
Yeah, so what happens is that uh, Yeah, so it is going to work better in practice because of these things that uh, this thing is going to to find some balance between how well you feed the data, but how uh, uh, you, you have some disk, some components here that penalize model complexity. Uh, so you will have something you will want something that fits the data well, but gives you some uh, curvature in your loss function that is, for example, relatively high, and that the weights are not really very uh, large in magnitude. Uh, and the balance of these two things will will give you uh, some th some solutions that work better in practice. Mainly because, especially because of this term. Uh, so if you have some something that fits the data quite well, and the 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 fit of the data is in a broad region, it's more likely that it works also well at uh, test time. Maybe in this uh, in this plot, for example, here, uh, if you change a bit the weights, then you move into regions that are not so good. But it seems that here you have more uh, flexibility. So the marginal likelihood, when you optimize the marginal likelihood with respect to alpha, you will try to find solutions that are more like this than uh, this one. Can, can you speak louder? I mean, when you change uh, alpha, you will be ch changing the shape of this uh, log posterior because alpha alpha is determining the shape. Uh, I mean, alpha is going to change uh, this term. So it's going to change some of the curvature, but it's going to affect the, the point W that you end up at. And uh, um, yeah, that's right. You have to redo the optimization. Yeah. So it's an iterative process. We didn't look at that uh, yet. But it's an iterative process. Um, let me see if this is here. Uh, so yeah, maybe this is the, the the best way to look at it. It's an iterative process where you will train your neural network. You will find some point estimate of uh, the weights. Then you will estimate the marginal likelihood based on this. And then you update alpha. And then you re-estimate the network. And then you repeat this process. Yeah, sorry, I didn't mention that. That's important. Uh, David Mackay, in his thesis, he was uh, retraining the network from scratch each time. Uh, more recent works, they don't really do that. They will just have some uh, uh, some optimi optimization method that gives you like an estimate of the Hessian. And then based on that estimate of the Hessian, you will obtain gamma by doing the eigen decomposition. And then you update hyperparameters, and then you repeat. Um, Good, maybe we'll probably have a short break very soon. Let me just uh, mention one thing. When you implement this in practice, uh, you can run into problems. And uh, that was a problem with uh, David Mackay's original method. David Mackay, he was working with the Hessian. Uh, I think he was uh, approximating it also by numerical differences. So he had some routines to give you gradients. And then uh, once you have gradients, you can obtain second derivatives using numerical differences. And he was doing this on a small neural networks. One of the problems with this approach is that it requires this Hessian of the log posterior. And with neural networks, uh, it may be that you have your optimization method. It gives you a map solution. But that point that the optimization method returns, it might not be a, a local optima. It could be a saddle point. And uh, your Hessian may not be positive definite. And then when that happens, you run into problems. Uh, so one approach is to uh, one approach to avoid that, and it's what many people use in practice when they have to work with Hessians of uh, loss functions of neural networks. 
and they don't want those to be uh, po uh, not positive uh, definite, you can use an approximation which is called the generalized Gauss-Newton approximation. And this is an approximation to the Hessian that is actually quite accurate and it's guaranteed to be positive definite. The idea is that you are going to approximate again the neural network with a linear model. You are going to feed that uh, linear model into your likelihood. And now you have the log likelihood of a linear model. And you work with the Hessian of that uh, log likelihood. Uh, because the linear model in most cases is going to have a positive definite likelihood function, this is guaranteed to give you a, a positive uh, definite uh, Hessian. Uh, so just to clarify, you take the, this approximation of the output of the neural network uh, as a linear model, you plug it in into your likelihood for your neural network. The likelihood could be just a Gaussian if it's regression, it could be softmax if it's classification and so on. You compute gradients and you will get this Gauss-Newton approximation these J's here are the Jacobian features. This is gradient vectors, one uh, for each data point. So J N is the gradient with respect to the weights for the nth data point. This G N here is the second derivative of the likelihood shown here. Uh, and then this J N is again the gradient feature um, or the, the Jacobian for the linear model. And then alpha is, is the same as before. Uh, so this uh, generalized Gauss-Newton ma matrix is guaranteed to be positive definite when the likelihood for the linear model is, for, for your neural network is positive definite, which is the case for softmax likelihoods, uh, logistic uh, for two cl classes or, or Gaussian. Um, and this actually works uh, quite well in practice. This example that I mentioned, this one is implemented in that way using this uh, generalized Gauss-Newton approximation to the Hessian. Um, good. Uh, I think we can probably have a break now, uh, and then we can come back uh, after that. Uh, Anna, if anyone has questions, also I'm happy to answer any of those during the break. So if you want to come down, for example, to ask questions, also I I would be happy to do that. Uh, five five minutes uh, or or ten minutes? How what's the usual break here? 10 minutes, okay, we'll be back in 10 minutes at uh, 2.45. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Typically, what you do is uh, you don't fully optimize your network uh, from scratch each time. So you just uh, do an iterative op optimization. And that's what you do in the, you, yeah. So you do like a small update of the weights, you fine tune the hyperparameters, and then you continue updating the weights. Um, it's going to be quite difficult because the hyperparameters depend on the Hessian. I mean, you will have the, I mean, you could imagine of doing that. Um, I think people didn't do it in the past because of the complexity of gradients and all that, because you will have like quite nasty gradients. Uh, I mean, you won't have like a, an analytic form. Uh, I think you won't have like a, a, people in the past usually liked a lot these analytic forms for updates. Say I, I have to update this parameter, what is the value? So you will have gradients of the hyperparameters alpha and beta and you will have to update those gradients. You could in principle do that. Uh, in the past people didn't do it because they, probably those gradients were complicated to obtain in practice and uh, People didn't, uh, I mean, people liked more like these closed form updates, but I can imagine that you could also do that. Yeah. Cool.
Uh, <laughs> I'm quite interested in that. Uh, and my students and I are working on this area. But I mean, I don't think there is like, I, there are maybe other routes that could be also promising. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I mean, it depends on the methods. One thing with the Laplace approximation is that for the point estimates are the same as in the original methods. So I think you don't really need to worry much about that. Uh, for example, looking at the predictive performance or accuracy and all that, because most of your predictions are going to be very similar to the deterministic methods. Uh, what we try to do is to look at the predictions on out of distribution data. And you have like now data points that are very different from I mean, it would be what we saw at the beginning here. No, like some, some regions that are far away from the data and you say, is my network too confident there or not? And you want your network to be uncertain there, but also making good predictions on the, on the training data. So I think that the good balance is looking at the performance on the training, I mean, the normal in distribution data, you would expect that to be similar as, as in the deterministic networks. But then you want an out of distribution data to make uh, not overly confident predictions. We are going to see also some ways to evaluate the networks here as well. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's what the uh, people do. Uh, so when you train your neural network, you're finding the map solution. And then that includes the log of the prior as a penalty. No? So you, when you are training, you are finding the weights of your neural network, you're already penalizing the weights with that. And the, the point estimate of the weights that you obtain depends on this prior. Uh, and then you, you apply the Laplace approximation uh, and it, it, it gives you like a, a posterior a Gaussian approximation uh, with some covariance matrix. Uh, that covariance matrix depends on the prior precision just because of the way it is defined by the... Uh, no, so let me see here. Uh, I mean, in the case of the neural network. Uh, so we saw it here, no? Like you have it in the... Yeah. This is the prior precision. So it's it appears in the, co in the covariance matrix for your Gaussian and also during training when you find the point estimate of the weights, it's going to be there as well. That's right. So if you don't use this, um, that's a very good question. Uh, it would still work because, uh, because of what we are going to see later. Uh, what we are going to see later is that what you care about is these linear models and working with the linear models of the neural network. So you just use the original neural network to obtain some feature representation for these uh, linear models. And then once you have those features, you could construct your linear models in any way. So you could think about training your neural network in any way, even without the weight regularization or whatever, you get the Jacobians of those neural networks. Those are going to be features. And then you are going to build using those features linear models. Those linear models are going to be, be making almost the same predictions as, as the neural networks, because we are going to see later that they actually can be as accurate as the neural networks, uh, but they are way easier to work with because they are linear models and uh, you could regularize them with a prior if you want. And I mean, that's what you do in practice. Okay, so that's kind of the idea with this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So in these small neural networks, uh, you can do the full Hessian. Obviously in uh, bigger neural networks, uh, that doesn't work and you will need to do approximations. And uh, we are going to see later several ways to do these approximations.
Uh, we are going to see examples of this, and it works better than deep ensembles. Yeah. Good. Precondition in um, in what context? Like pre-processing, maybe you mean pre-processing the data or? Okay. Okay, I don't fully know what you mean by preconditioning the data. Okay, of the log likelihood, you mean? Or because the data doesn't have any eigenvalues or anything, the data is just. Uh, <laughs> The data is not like a matrix or anything, no? Uh, okay, it's because you are adding this alpha here with the identity. There are this term in the, in the Hessian or yeah. Okay, I'm not fully sure. I mean, what people do is usually in these test squares, you will usually have a, a, a matrix uh, that is the, the outer product of your design matrix with itself. And you could run into problems with that because it could be not invertible. And then you add like a constant times the identity and that becomes better, it's, it's invertible. That's what you mean? Yeah, and like in reaction. is that what you are meaning? What do you mean? Yeah, on the data, okay. And the thing is that I don't know what preconditioning in the data is. Uh... Um, I mean, it's local because you do it around the map point. So you could say that it's local in that sense. But then also when you linearize your model to make predictions, you do it around the map solution and it's different for each data point. Now for each data point, if you do this linearization here, for each data point, the, the gradient here is different. No, because this is evaluated at the map solution, but evaluated at X and X is going to be different for different data points. So you could imagine that, yes, it's like local, around each data point, no? You look at the predictions that the network does for a new input X, and then you see how the output of the network changes as you change W for that data point, but then you just uh, linearize it with respect to, to W there. So you do it like locally for each data point when you make predictions. But then when you find the Gaussian approximation to the posterior, you're also doing this Gaussian approximation locally because you only lo look at the mode and at the curvature and you ignore, I mean, imagine that you have a complicated posterior. If you just tell me the point at which the mode is and the curvature there, that's the only information about the posterior that I need. And I can throw away all the rest of the posterior. So that's why you could say that it's also like a local approximation to the posterior. So there are several local approximations going on here. Yeah. Yes. I don't. I didn't look at the details. I think he has uh, maybe stuff in his website available. Uh, so there might be some stuff there. Uh, I'm. I'm pretty sure there is some info on the competitions that he won. I think I. I remember reading that it was based on this uh, tuning of the valences. But uh, yeah, I don't know the details of this. There might be, I mean, I think in his website, he probably has some information. Okay. I think people should be coming back. Okay, I think we are going to start back. Uh, if if any, everyone can come back to their seats, please.
Good. Um, <clears throat> Good, so we are going to continue uh, just a summary of what we have seen. Uh, so David Mackay gave us a way to apply this Laplace approximation to neural networks. He was using this linearization of the model to make the predictions. And then he also showed us how to do hyperparameter tuning by optimizing this uh, marginal likelihood or, or model evidence. Um, and uh, then implementing this approach in practice involves optimizing your weights. This could be done using a second order optimization method, for example. People were using a small data set at that time, so they could use batch learning. And you could use uh, some uh, uh, approaches where you update your weights. Maybe you do one step of uh, quasi-Newton method. You obtain uh, an estimate of the Hessian, uh, obtained with a generalized Gauss-Newton approximation. You could obtain the eigen decomposition of the Hessian, obtain this parameter gamma, and then given gamma and the current point estimate for the weights, you update hyperparameters and then you iterate the process. Uh, and this works uh, very well in practice. Uh, we have focused so far on regression problems. Now the problem is uh, how do you deal with classification? With classification, for binary classification, you can exactly do the same as uh, what we did in the uh, binary classification problem at the beginning. You can approximate your, log your logistic function with a probit, and you get an analytic solution. And that's what David Mackay did in his PhD thesis. You could have more than binary classification. You could have more than two uh, categories. And then you have to have a short max likelihood instead of uh, logistic. And things become a bit more complicated, uh, but uh, you can actually apply the same methods. So you could have this categorical uh, probability for the outputs, given the output of the neural network with some uh, short max probabilities. And uh, what you could do, um, sorry here, yeah. what you could do is uh, to perform the same approximation that we did with the logistic function, but now with the short max. With the logistic function, we were taking the input of the deterministic neural network to the logistic function, and we were dividing by some uncertainties. We're going to do exactly the same here with the uh, short max. So you can take the deterministic output of the neural network, and then you can divide it by some uncertainties. It's the same formula as for the logistic function, but now you are dividing here by the diagonal of this covariance matrix. And now because the problem is uh, multi-class, our neural network has multiple outputs. And then it's, instead of, seeing a, of having a scalar output or predictive variance, we have a matrix and we could just look at the marginal variances of that, the diagonal entries in the matrix. And that's what we are doing here. So you could understand this as a generalization from uh, the logistic case to the softmax. This could seem like a bit of a brute approximation because you are just basically using the same formula and just uh, taking the diagonal entries in this covariance matrix. Uh, but this actually works uh, quite well in practice. Uh, there is actually a paper by uh, Philip Hennig uh, where he studies different approximations when you have to integrate Gaussians with respect so to softmax. And he actually shows that this works uh, really well. Uh, cool. Uh, so we can do this approximation uh, just uh, taking the making the same predictions as the deterministic model, but scaling the input so that if we have high uncertainty, we decrease the input to the softmax and then things become, the probabilities are going to be closer to, to being uniform, more than uh, uh, closer to one or zero. Uh, this is an example for classification. It's taken from uh, one of the publications from David Mackay, also from work uh, related to his thesis. Uh, and we see here a binary classification problem these are papers from the 90s, so the quality of the figures are not, is not great, and everything was black and white. Uh, uh, I managed to get these figures from David Mackay's website, because if you look at the actual journal publication, the quality of the figures are even worse. Uh, so this is a binary classification problem. You have to classify square points, and uh, I think these are stars. Uh, 
you can fit a neural network, find a map uh, estimate of the weights, and you get these uh, predictions. White is uh, you predict class one with high probability, black class two with high probability. And uh, you see that when you do the Laplace approximation, your predictions in regions where you don't have much data, for example, in this region, you are more uncertain. And here it's quite confident. Uh, and the same in this region here, you are more uncertain while this model is quite confident in this region where there is no data. So this is a region where there is no data and this is quite confident. Um, good, so this shows more or less how it was working in that case. Uh, we're going to see a bit more on uh, recent works on the Laplace approximation. And uh, actually we're going to see that this very old method can work very well in practice. Uh, and we're going to get a bit of some insights on, on why it works so well. Uh, uh, so this is based on some work uh, that we did in Cambridge. Uh, this was a collaboration show with uh, Jinsen. Uh, is this, this work called uh, In Between Uncertainty? Uh, Andrew, who is a PhD student in Cambridge, uh, I think he finished, uh, or he's probably about to finish now, uh, with Rich. Uh, he did this work in collaboration with uh, Jinsen and me and Rich. Uh, the idea is to study different methods and to see how well they have uh, uncertainty uh, in regions where there is not much data. And we are focused in these regions in between data, uh, in between data points. What we see here in this uh, simple problem is that methods like uh, mean field variational inference, they tend to underestimate uncertainty quite a lot. Here in this region, you don't have much data, but the model is quite confident. Uh, this is also mean field, but not with a, sorry, a variational approach, but not with a factorized Gaussian approximation, but with a fully correlated Gaussian. And we see that the uncertainty in this region is still quite uh, low. And the linearized Laplace model actually gives you high uncertainty here, which is what, what we would ideally want to, to know that the model is uncertain in, in that region. And it can be quite close to what you would obtain with uh, Hamilton Monte Carlo, which could be like a ground truth uh, method in, in this setting. Um, we did more experiments here. Uh, I mean, mainly Andrew did, did this. Uh, I removed some of the examples because there were many there were many baselines here, but we have here some baselines, which is uh, we have map. Uh, these are like ReLU units or tan h. It doesn't matter much. You have a mean field variational inference, and then we have the linearized Laplace, but we also Laplace with sampling. And we know that that plus with sampling doesn't work that well. And that's actually what happens here. That uh, Laplace with sampling, if you look at the uh, way it is, this is Laplace with sampling, Laplace with sampling, Laplace with sampling here. It's always in the bottom. Uh, it's not really good. Um, the Laplace uh, linearized is on the top always. And it does uh, actually quite well compared with uh, at least the uh, mean field and variational inference. Uh, sorry, and the map. Yeah. Um, protein. I mean, they are very similar. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Indeed, indeed, in that problem, it worked relatively well. Uh, it could be that your posterior is very big. This is actually one of the data sets where you have more data. So it could be that uh, there is not so much uncertainty and maybe your Hessian was already quite concentrated. So it could be that that's the case, but uh, I, I don't know. So linear Laplace seems to work quite well here in this case. It outperforms the sample Laplace. Uh, in this work, there is also something quite interesting, which is based on uh, splitting the data in a not in a traditional way in train and test sets where you just split the data iid we were considering some in between uh, uncertainty we were considering gap splits so if you have for example one variable this could be the first feature x1 and it could be like having some histograms like this for example maybe this is your data distribution what we do is we uh, fix some gap here in the center, and then you split your data so that this is now test. And this is a training. 
and this is usually this is called the gap splits. Uh, and what happens is that if you train a predictor uh, on the training data, then it's going to have to make predictions on new data points for which a particular feature it has values that were not observed before. And that's going to make the predictions more difficult. And the model is going to have to extrapolate a bit into regions where there is not really a lot of data nearby, uh, at least for that feature. And what you see is that in some problems like, uh, um, I think in energy, in this problem in energy, you see that the deterministic model is getting horrible log likelihoods. The predictive log likelihood is horrible. No, it's minus 100 or so when the other ones is like way smaller. And the reason for this is that the deterministic method is having very low, uh, small confidence bands. It's making very confident predictions. And it's this particular setting where there is not much data around, then your predictions are going to be all very wrong in that case. Uh, and the, in this other data set, I think Naval uh, is more or less the same. You have here, minus 800 or whatever. And the linearized Laplace is actually quite robust. In those problems where the other methods fail catastrophically, it's actually giving you uh, good results. And it, it, it shows that in regions where there is not much data, it's giving you high uncertainty values, which is what you want. Uh, cool. Uh, so that was some analysis of, of, of how this works in practice. Uh, one thing that I didn't discuss much is the computational cost of this. Uh, and the computational cost is actually quite high. The reason for this is that to apply the Laplace approximation, you need to compute the, the Hessian or an approximation to the Hessian. And you will need to invert that to obtain uh, the posterior, the, the covariance matrix of your Gaussian. Inverting the Hessian is going to have a cost that is cubic in the number of parameters. And uh, before neural networks were not so big. We saw this example with six hidden units. No, you can, <laughs> you can uh, work with Hessians in that setting. Uh, more recent neural networks are really big. They have many parameters and you won't be able to uh, work in, in practice uh, with Hessians in that case. So you need to come up with approximations. Uh, so, there are some people that actually came up with ways to approximate these Hessians uh, in neural networks. And there are approximations based on Kronecker products. Uh, has anyone heard about Kronecker products before with matrices? Can anyone raise the hand? Okay, so many people here have, have seen this. Uh, a Kronecker product between two matrices is shown here. It's just a... Uh, Yeah, so it's, it's shown here. Um, so the idea is that you just uh, take the entries in matrix A and you are going to multiply that entry by the whole matrix B. And then that's going to be another entry in the product matrix. So the number of uh, rows and columns in the, when you do this Kronecker product scales uh, as a product operation. No, the number of rows of the product is, of the Kronecker product is the product of the number of rows of the individual matrices. Uh, so this matrix actually could be huge. No, these matrices can be relatively small and you get like a huge matrix by doing this simple operation. The good thing of Kronecker products is that they have many useful properties. In particular, this one. The inverse of a Kronecker product is the Kronecker product of the inverses of the matrices. So this is the inverse of a huge matrix. Now, if, if A and B are relatively big, the Kronecker product is going to be a huge matrix. And now we are writing the inverse of that huge matrix in terms of the inverses of the smaller matrices. It turns out that you can show that uh, these uh, Hessian matrices for neural networks they have uh, some of this Kronecker product structure. And this will allow us to approximate the inverse uh, using this, these techniques. Um, 
this is like a very this is probably one of the most technical parts of this presentation so i'm not going to get a lot into the details of it but the idea is that uh we are interested in working with the generalized gauss newton matrix approximation and uh you can actually show that the generalized gauss newton approximation for the likelihood Imagine that you just have a model with the likelihood, forget about the prior. Uh, you want to compute the Hessian of your likelihood. Uh, you approximate that Hessian with a generalized Gauss-Newton approximation. That's going to be uh, Jacobian. So it's the, the gradient of the output of the neural network with respect to the weights. And then you have here the matrix of second derivatives of the likelihood. Uh, it's, it's this one, is the second derivatives of the likelihood with respect to the outputs of the neural network. HL is the, the last, uh, the output units of the neural network, what would be, what you could feed into a softmax, no? And then this is just the, the second, the matrix of second derivatives of a softmax likelihood for a particular data point with respect to the inputs to the softmax. Uh, so this is a matrix that is a number of output units of the network times number of output units. And computing this is relatively easy. Uh, then here you have Jacobians. Um, and what you can show is that this, the product of the Jacobians times this uh, matrix times Jacobian can be written as a Kronecker product. Where this a these vectors a are just the the inputs to uh, the the L layer. So this is just a this is just the generalized Gauss Newton approximate the, the generalized Gauss Newton matrix for the weights in the L layer. You can show that for a particular layer, for only the weights in that layer, the um, block diagonal corresponding entry in the generalized Gauss-Newton matrix, which could be given by this, has a Kronecker product structure. It's just a simple matrix. This is the outer product of just a vector of inputs to the layer. And then this is another matrix that is more complicated, but uh, it can be computed efficiently. So the key message here is for a single data point, when your data set has only one data point, you can write the diagonal entry in your approximation to the Hessian as a, a Kronecker product. And this means that if you have to compute the inverse of this uh, block diagonal entry in your Hessian approximation for that layer, if you have to invert that, you could just uh, do it using this, uh, using this uh, formula here. So, this could be a large matrix, is the number of weights in that layer squared, the size of that matrix. Uh, and now this matrix is just uh, the number of inputs to the layer. And the number of, uh, of inputs to a layer is usually a small. It could be maybe 1,000 in, in relatively large neural networks, uh, but you can work with uh, matrices of size 1,000. Um, let me move this here from here. This is something called the preactivation was Gauss Newton matrix. I won't get much into the details of this, but this matrix can be computed efficiently. Uh, and it's also a matrix that uh, the size is the number of outputs of that layer. So in the end, you have that uh, the block diagonal entry in the Hessian is now the Kronecker product of a matrix, which is number of inputs to the layer number of inputs and another matrix which is a number of outputs times number of outputs uh, you can compute these matrices recursively i won't go much into the details of that uh, but the key thing is that in the end you will have that the block diagonal entries for layers in your network they have this uh, Kronecker product structure and you are summing over all the data points in your data set this creates some problem because this, this sum of uh, Kronecker products doesn't really factorize as a Kronecker product. So that kind of destroys 
our hope to use uh, chronic air products. <laughs> But uh, what has been proposed uh, in the literature is to just approximate this sum of Kronecker products by the Kronecker products of the sums over the data points. Um, and then you also assume that the Hessian has a block diagonal structure. You assume that you only have dependencies between weights uh, belonging to the same layer. And weights that are between different layers, the, cor the correlation between weights in different layers is zero. You will be assuming that. Uh, when you have these assumptions, then you can actually work uh, with very large neural networks. And you will be able to compute uh, uh, approximations to the uh, Hessians of the, those large neural networks uh, very efficiently. Any questions on this part? I think the, the key thing on the details is uh, this thing you have now, you are looking now at uh, the correlations between weights in the same layer and you ignore other correlations. And now that uh, each entry in the Hessian for a particular layer is approximated by this Kronecker product uh, thing. So this was proposed by, um, let me see. Yeah, by Ritter, Botef, and David Barber. Uh, they proposed this scalable Laplace approximation for neural networks. And it was published at iClear in 2018. And this is described in the thesis of Alexander Botev. They have this amazing uh, way to compute very accurate approximations to the Hessian. And they can now scale the Laplace approximation to really big neural networks. It sounds like something amazing. You could say this is like, <laughs> a revolution. Uh, they wrote this paper, and you can look at the thesis by Alexander Botev. Uh, and in the thesis, they test the method in practice. And they get this. What do you think of these predictions? This is some toy problem. They do the Kronecker factor Laplace. They have some diagonal approximation to Laplace, which is usually not very good. Full Laplace is horrible. What's going on here? Anyone has some idea of what's going on? Why it's looking so horribly wrong? They are using sampling. <laughs> they are using sampling for making predictions. And we know that it doesn't work. Like Neil Lawrence did this in his thesis 20 years before, and it didn't work. So it's not working because they are using sampling. And they came up with many different uh, ways to correct this, they introduce in additional scaling constants for the Hessian, trying to make the Hessian small to reduce the variance so that it's closer to the map solution and it doesn't really make so horrible predictions. Um, so that's right. They are making predictions without using the linearization that David Mackay was using at the beginning, uh, which is key to make this method work. Uh, I mean, it, the approach is great. Uh, the only problem is that they, they couldn't really show it a great results in terms of predictions because it doesn't really work. So if you look at the paper, they have a lot of stuff and kind of tricks to, to correct for the problems of, of sampling. Uh, even though the, the method to approximate the Hessian actually works well, but the, the problem was that they were using sampling to make predictions. Um, later, uh, you had some paper by Alex Zimmer, uh, called Sepan, Bauer, uh, and they actually uh, justify to use this linear model for predictions. They actually look at the same techniques that Alexander was using to make scalable uh, approximations to the Hessian. Uh, but now they say, look, you are using the generalized Gauss-Newton uh, matrix to approximate the Hessian. We have seen that the generalized Gauss-Newton matrix is based on a linear approximation to the model. Now the generalized Gauss-Newton matrix approximation to the Hessian is obtained by replacing your nonlinear neural network with a linear model uh, on the weights, no, a, a linear approximation to the weights. If you are using that uh, in your Hessian approximation, and it's actually the true Hessian of a linear model based on those uh, uh, features given by the first uh, derivative. If you are using that in your generalized Gauss-Newton matrix approximation, you should also use it to make predictions. And they propose to 
do sampling, but now they do sampling with the linear model. Uh, so they are going to have this same linearized model that we saw before. Uh, and then when they make predictions, they are going to sample from the Gaussian on the weights, but they use the linearized model to make predictions. And then they did a large scale experiments with larger neural networks. Uh, these are results on Fashion MNIST, uh, Cypher 10, and they compare the map solution with the Laplace no linearized method, which is what uh, Alexander Botelev was using, and with the linearized model. Uh, and you can see that uh, the accuracy, the negative log likelihood, uh, the out of distribution uh, area under the rock curve, all is much better uh, for the linearized Laplace method, and it improves over the, the map solution in a way that these uncertainties are now actually quite good, and, and they they make uh, uh, that they are more 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 much better. Good. Uh, what is interesting is that they are tuning the prior variance, not using the the model evidence. They are using uh, a validation set. And uh, in practice, as we are going to see later, it's not actually so easy to, to tune prior variances using this marginal likelihood uh, in, in big neural networks and, and more modern neural networks. And we're going to see later a bit why, why this is the case. Um, they actually have another paper where they tune hyperparameters using this marginal likelihood uh, and they report gains. Uh, my students and I, we have been trying to do that as well, and it didn't really work that well for us. And uh, we are going to describe later uh, why we think it's at least not straightforward, uh, at least to, to take the, the Laplace approximation as, uh, as done so far until what we have seen now, and then uh, optimize hyperparameters with the marginal likelihood. We're going to see that actually you need to change some small things in the way you tune hyperparameters with the marginal likelihood to actually make it work uh, well. Uh, so these are results that they seem to work well. I, we tried to do something similar. It didn't work for us. Uh, and I'm going to describe later what you could do to, to try to improve things. Uh, good. Uh, so I think that's a summary of some previous work on trying to um, to scale up this uh, Laplace approximation. I'm going to describe now another approach that is going to also scale up in a different way, uh, this Laplace approximation. And it's going to be based on a uh, subnetwork inference. Let's see how much we have time. Uh, good. So this is a recent paper that we published at ICML uh, last year. Um, and this is a collaboration with uh, some of my PhD students and, and former postdocs, uh, Eric Daxberger, Eric Narinsky, Javier Antoran, and uh, James Salingham. Uh, the idea here is that uh, neural networks are getting bigger and bigger. <laughs> and uh, obviously, scaling this Laplace approximation is not working when you have such big neural networks. Uh, so when you want to do approximate inference in, the, in such big neural networks, the easiest thing could be to do mean field variational inference. Now it's like a scalable way. You just have uh, mean parameters and variance parameters and you tune them optimizing your elbow. It's uh, scalable. You can uh, train it using mini batches. Uh, the problem is that the quality of these approximations of mean field, they are not so great. We have seen that in these uh, experiments on the gap splits. No, that it can underestimate uncertainty quite a lot. Uh, so we are going to try to come up with something better. Uh, and the main question that we address here is, do we really need to do inference over all the weights to get accurate uncertainty estimates? Uh, maybe we can actually do inference only on a subset of the weights and we could still obtain quite good results. And this is inspired also a bit by the idea that people do in uh, pruning of neural networks. Neural networks are actually very robust and you can actually remove some of the connections in your neurons and the predictions of the neural network, they can still be quite accurate. Uh, maybe we could do something similar when we want to obtain uncertainties. Maybe we can ignore uncertainties in some of the weights and then uh, the quality of our uncertainties, they could still be quite accurate. And that's what we are actually going to do in this, in this work. Uh, 
the approach that we follow is going to be called subnetwork inference. And the idea is that we're going to find some subnetwork in terms of a subset of weights on over which we are going to capture uncertainty. And then the rest of the weights are going to be deterministic. No? So we're going to have now a posterior approximation that is going to be some uh, point estimate on a subset of the weights. And then we want to be Bayesian on the other weights. And what we are going to do is to approximate the posterior distribution over the weights in our subnetwork with uh, another approximation. So we are splitting the weights into weights over which we are deterministic and then weights over which we are going to be uh, uh, Bayesian and we are going to capture uncertainties. This sounds great, uh, but we need to think about how to implement this in practice. We need to answer some questions. Uh, the first is how we are going to obtain our subnetwork uh, posterior approximation. Most of you can imagine what we are going to use here. We are going to use the Laplace approximation to do this. Uh, then we need to see how we are going to fix the values of the weights uh, for which we are deterministic. Uh, and then how we select our subnetwork. No, maybe it's not, uh, I mean, you could think of choosing weights at random, but maybe the probability that maybe some weights are more uh, important than others, no? And maybe if we choose weights at random, maybe this method is not going to work so well. Uh, so we need to address these questions. So our approximation on the subnetwork weights is going to be the Laplace approximation. We have seen a lot about this. We already, we are now experts on this method. Uh, um, it's very easy to implement in practice. You just do point estimates of your network. Uh, and then once you have the point estimates, then you get some uh, uh, approximation to the Hessian and you obtain uncertainties. It's not as scalable as we have seen, uh, but if you work on a sub network that is uh, of the right size, then you will be able to scale up this method. Uh, so that's what we are going to do. Uh, the advantage of the uh, Laplace approximation is that to implement it, you already need to find some point estimates for the weights, no? Because you, you just train your neural network normally and you find some uh, W map. And because you already have point estimates for the weights, you already know what, how to fix the weights of the, the weights that are not part of your sub network, no? You just give them to the point estimate that, that was obtained before. Um, so this is how this method works. Imagine that you have this neural network, you trained it just uh, using normal uh, training in any way that you want. You get some point estimates of the weights. You are going to choose a sub network. These are going to be some weights for which you are going to capture uncertainties. You will be now uh, putting some distribution on those weights. And then when you make predictions, you just use uh, the whole neural network, for some weights you are deterministic and for others you are uh, uncertain. Uh, we have addressed some questions already. How do we obtain the sub network posterior approximation? We said we are going to use this Laplace approximation. Uh, how do we fix the weights of the network that are not part of the sub network? We just leave them to the same value that was obtained during the, the finding of the map solution. Uh, how do we select the, net, the net sub network weights? And this is like a, an, an important question. Uh, what we are going to do is to try to find some uh, posterior distribution given our approximations that is close to the true posterior. So imagine that you have the, the true posterior, the full posterior, and then with the sub network posterior. The sub network posterior is Q and is given by some Gaussian approximation on the subnetwork weights given by the Laplace approximation. The mean is just the map solution, and this is the Hessian. Um, and then you have like deterministic weights. And we want to make this close to the true posterior. Obviously, the true posterior is not tractable, but we can approximate it. And here, what we are going to use for our approximation is the diagonal Laplace approximation. Uh, I mean, you could you could use the diagonal approximation. It's not the sorry, it's not the diagonal Laplace. We are going to use a diagonal uh, approximation. It's a factorized approximation. Um, so this is now a factorized approximation, 
Uh, and we have said before that these factorized approximations, they don't work that well, at least in the case of mean field variational base, uh, it was not working so well with neural networks. Uh, what we expect here is that this diagonal assumption for the subnetwork selection is better than making the diagonal assumption for inference and for getting uncertainties. So even though the diagonal assumption is not so good in terms of getting good uncertainties, maybe it still works well for, for choosing the subnetwork. Uh, and that's what we do. And in practice, actually, it works well. Uh, the solution, so here we are minimizing this uh, Wasserstein distance between these two distributions. Uh, we use the Wasserstein distance because here we have point masses on some weights. And if you use something like the Kubak library divergence, you are going to run into problems with the delta functions. So that's why we use the Wasserstein distance. Um, uh, you can actually show that uh, the solution to this is just to choose the weights for which this uh, factorized approximation uh, have higher uncertainty, which kind of makes some sense. No, if you want to capture uncertainty in your subnetwork, it makes sense to choose some weights for which you are already quite uncertain. And maybe other weights for which you already have a good point estimates, then probably it's fine not to, to capture uncertainty on those weights. So our subnetwork is given here by this, uh, uh, let's see if this works, yeah. It's, it's shown here. Uh, sorry. <laughs> but it's the weights uh, with the largest marginal variance. Uh, that's the key. So you can imagine of having some uh, mean field or some some approach that uses a factorization of the of the posterior distribution. You can look at the marginal variances of the weights. And then you just choose those which uh, largest marginal variance that seem to be changing the most. And then you just uh, capture uncertainty on those. What we use to, to estimate this uh, uncertainty, we use a method that is called SWAG that actually in our, I mean, we tried several ones and it's the one that worked better for us. So the way it works is that you train your neural network. Uh, and as you are training the network, you get some uh, snapshots of the weights and uh, you are just going to use those uh, and see which weights are changing the most as you train your neural network. And those are the ones that will, for which you will be having higher uncertainty. Uh, how does this work in practice? Uh, we show here ex examples on this toy problem. This is a neural network with two hidden units. There are about 2,500 weights. It's not a very big neural network because we want to compare with the full Laplace approach. And what we see here is that the full Laplace approach gets these estimates of uncertainty. Here you have high uncertainty in this region where there is no data. If you use a diagonal Laplace approximation, you get this, which is horrible. It doesn't really capture uncertainty in the, in the, in the central region. Uh, the map solution also doesn't capture uncertainty because it's, I mean, it's deterministic with some noise, no? and the noise is the same for any input. So it doesn't capture any uncertainty. You could do uncertainty only in the last layer of this network, and it gives you more uncertainty in the central region, but this is still not as good as the full Laplace approximation. We then look at subnetwork inference, and we look at the predictions that you could obtain using 50% of your weights for your subnetwork, 3% of the weights for your subnetwork, which is a very small number, and then 1% of the weights for the subnetwork. It's only 26 weights. This is a subnetwork with only 26, 26 weights. And what you see is that even just with 1% of the weights, you are still able to obtain high uncertainty in this uh, central region. Uh, and using a clever way how to choose the subnetwork makes a difference. Like if you choose uh, the subnetwork randomly, you would get something like this because you are just, just, you are just picking weights, maybe that doesn't really, they don't really accept, uh, affect your uncertainty. Um, we see that the, at least our approach for choosing the sub network is better than, than doing this randomly. Um, so this is a toy problem. The key question is how does this work in more complicated settings? So here we try a large neural network. This is a ResNet 18. They, it has about 11 million weights. And we're going to use the largest possible sub network that we can work with. And this is going to be a subnetwork 
with 42,000 weights. This is the largest uh, that we can afford to, to obtain uh, this approximation to the Hessian and, and, and the inverted. Uh, this is like 0.38% of the weights. <laughs> to evaluate the performance of this method, we look at uh, some setting where we make predictions for out of distribution data. We are making predictions for out of distribution data and uh, what is going to happen is that all these networks, they are highly confident for out of distribution data. And the predictions they make, they are always nearly wrong in out of distribution data because the, the network is making predictions on data that it has never seen before. And the, the outputs will be random there. Yeah. Uh, so this is a rotated MNIST. It's a framework where you train your network on MNIST and then you force the network to make predictions when you rotate the digits. And the rotated digits are very different from the original ones. So the network predictions are going to be very wrong in that setting. Uh, you can see here that as you increase the amount of rotation, the predictions, this is the predictive log likelihood, it goes down, it's deteriorating, uh, and it deteriorates uh, seriously in all these different methods. Um, what we see is that our approach, which is this light blue method, uh, is more robust than the others. You would also have to look at the predictions when you don't rotate the methods, but our method is based on this uh, uh, Laplace approximation for which the point estimates of our method are the same as the, the map method, the model that doesn't capture uncertainty. And typically the predictive uncertainty is very low on the training on, on, in distribution data. Yeah. Um, I believe we looked into something like this, but we didn't really do, do like an exhaustive thing. I think my students, they looked a bit into this, but I mean, I don't think we didn't get any pattern or anything. There. <laughs> yeah, so um, yeah, this is great. All these other methods are deteriorating quite a lot. They are making actually overly confident predictions on out of distribution data. And our method is uh, just saying, I am uncertain here and I don't really know. And this is a corrupted cipher, it's the same. You are now corrupting the images with some different corruption methods. One is like adding this blur effect and you have different levels of corruption uh, from level zero where there is no corruption at all and level five that there is a lot of corruption. And what you can see is that all the methods, they deteriorate quite a lot, but our method uh, shown in blue, it's quite robust uh, and uh, it doesn't deteriorate much. What is interesting is that we are able to improve over some very strong baselines, like for example, ensemble methods. These are deep ensembles and uh, we are obtaining better uh, out of distribution predictions uh, in, this, in this case. And this is actually quite surprising because deep ensembles is usually a very strong baseline. It's very hard to, to obtain better results than, than that method. The question is, what happens if you even use a smaller subnetworks? How, th how do things deteriorate? And uh, what we see is that even with very small subnetworks, we are able to do quite well. Uh, for example, we show here deep ensembles in orange, and we show now subnetworks instead of size about 40,000 weights, we see 10,000, 3,000, and 1,000. And we see that even 3,000 weights only is improving over deep ensembles in this in this setting, which is quite uh, quite quite interesting. Good. So some take-home message on this: we have seen this linearized Laplace subnetwork method. It can be easily applied to uh, pre-trained models. You could imagine that you have a, a neural network that someone already pre-trained. Uh, you could then uh, try to extract a subnetwork and then uh, apply the this approach uh, there. It seems to be more accurate than other techniques uh, like a SWAG, a deep ensembles and other techniques. It ap applies to uh, neural networks without sacrificing much in terms of quality. Um, and we have seen that it can outperform existing methods like uh, deep ensembles also that are usually very strong. So that's, that's actually quite interesting. Good, that finishes that part. I don't know if there are any more questions on the subnetwork inference. Yeah.
uh, yeah, it's like, a, I mean, it's like a way to, I mean, it's just a justification for uh, obtaining good results with uh, smaller networks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the two things are quite different because one is just looking at the quality of the predictions. I mean, and we are just using the whole network for the for the point estimates. So it's quite different to look at the the subnetworks that make accurate predictions as the whole network or, or just subnetworks on which you capture uncertainty. The two things are quite different. Obviously, the question is how to find these subnetworks. We have proposed this approach. It seems to be work well. Uh, my students, they have done some other methods and they have other approaches that also work quite well. Uh, so I don't think that this thing based on the Wasserstein approach is the best one. I think you could also do even simpler things and they might also work well. I think they looked at, for example, looking at the magnitude of the weights, and uh, based on that, also you can also obtain good results. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I think it's like an area where um, there could be more work done, also. But uh, maybe very simple methods like this thing based on the marginal variance or the magnitude of the weights that might also be good enough. Good. Um, we can maybe move into some of the last uh, parts of the tutorial. Uh, this is way more recent work and maybe a bit more technical. Uh, so I will get less into the details of this. Uh, I think the key idea is, is maybe more important. Um, so we have to think about what we have been doing. We have seen this subnetwork approach that is based on the Laplace approximation and it seems to be working quite well. Something that I didn't mention is how to tune the prior precision. In the subnetwork inference, work, we were doing this by cross-validation. And we were not able to really get good results without uh, using this cross-validation. Using uh, the techniques that David Mackay was using, that didn't really work well for us. Um, and there are other things that we were using, and they actually uh, conflict with the Laplace approximation. We were using, for example, batch normalization to train the networks. Batch normalization. Uh, another normalization techniques are actually quite common. And these techniques, they try to create some uh, invariance in the output of your network to the scale of the weights. So if you have a network with a batch normalization layer, you could imagine that if you scale the weights by some constant, the network is going to be insensitive to these scalings because it's, it's uh, doing some normalization as you feed your data through the network. All these techniques, they are going to conflict with the Laplace approximation. And in this recent paper that has been just accepted at ICML very recently, we show how to actually uh, tune hyperparameters with the Laplace approximation in a better way. Uh, and actually, so that it actually works and you don't have to use these uh, cross-validation techniques. Uh, this, this is some work with uh, uh, again, uh, some of my PhD students uh, and uh, postdocs and other collaborators. Um, um, we have already seen the Laplace approximation. We are uh, linearizing the model. We do this to make predictions and to obtain this uh, generalized Gauss-Newton approximation. So there is a generalization there. Uh, when we do this uh, generalized uh, Gauss-Newton approximation, we obtain the Hessian for a uh, log posterior for a linear model. And uh, this, uh, this linear model has some interesting properties. Uh, it's using the uh, Jacobians or the gradients of the original neural network that we trained by map uh, estimation uh, as features. Uh, and then uh, the loss function is going to be, uh, I mean, th this log posterior in the linear model is going to be, uh, or, or, or the, the loss function is going to be convex. Uh, and this is going to be actually good if we want to use a, a Gaussian to approximate that. Uh, 
Um, and I mean, we have seen that there are some closed form formulas for predictions and then for marginal likelihood estimation. Um, there are still some questions that we didn't describe much. The first one is David Mackay uh, and old works, they were using uh, quasi Newton methods for training the networks and they were using batch. Uh, and with those methods, you will find actually a local optima with high probability. Your, your optim optimizer is going to be very good. Uh, with a stochastic gradient descent, you see many batches, that's way less likely. You will just get some good solution, but you won't find some local optima. Uh, there are also these things like batch norm that uh, they are widely spread at the moment. And as I said, there is some conflict when you use the, the Laplace approximation because you have a Gaussian prior on the weights that penalizes the magnitude of your weights, but these models, they are insensitive to scalings of the weights. So that creates some conflict there. Uh, before we were tuning hyperparameters with cross validation. And with the model evidence, we didn't get it to work. And actually, I can tell you what happens uh, in this example. You can choose different uh, prior precisions and you will get different predictive uncertainties. And the, the effect of the prior precision on the uncertainty is very important. Uh, you want to have the right value of the prior precision to get accurate uncertainties. If it's too uh, high, your precision, then you, you underestimate uncertainty quite a lot. And if it's too low, you overestimate uncertainty. So you want to have the right value there. If you use uh, the rhythmic eyes approach to choose the uh, prior precision, it doesn't work. It gives you this value. It seems kind of okay -ish, but this is actually overestimating uncertainty. You would like something like this or this that works better in practice. Uh, and the question is, why is this happening? Uh, and I'm going to tell you why this happens now and how you can solve it and fix it. Uh, uh, so why is this happening? Uh, first of all, we are training the networks not with uh, uh, with uh, quasi-Newton methods or, or batch training. And we are more likely going to end up into some uh, point that is not the minima of your loss function. And you are going to come up with a Gaussian approximation there. Uh, and this, that doesn't seem to be so good. Uh, the other thing that happens, um, I didn't go much into the details of this, but uh, when you train your, uh, neural network with uh, like quite well to a, to a local mode where the gradients are zero, you can show that the point estimate of the weights of the neural network would be also the optimal uh, point estimate of the weights in your corresponding linear model. This means that if you are working with actually the linear model, the linearized model, in, or you are fully training your neural network, you could actually use the same weights from uh, the neural network into the linear model. And everything would be, uh, I mean, it would be the same. If you try to find, for example, the map solution in your linear model, it would be the same as in the neural network. You can show that the because of the, the gradients uh, that that's the case. However, what is going to happen is that if you optimize your neural network, but you find some uh, value theta tilde that is not actually a local minima, and you linearize your network, theta tilde is not going to be then the map solution of the linear model. And if you are thinking about working with this linear model and actually estimating the marginal likelihood of your linear model, your formula for the marginal likelihood from the Laplace approximation includes some term here that comes from the prior, and this is the map solution for the weights. And there is some Hessian here. Uh, the key thing is that because we are not training fully the neural network, now the map solution or the, the point estimate for the weights of the network that we obtain is not the map solution for the linear model. And this means that if you use this uh, estimate of the marginal likelihood for the linear model, uh, then things are going to be wrong because you are not using actually the map solution of your linear model. So this, this thing now is wrong because you are using the point estimates for the neural network that you found for training 
and not the point estimates for the linear model that maximize the, the log posterior in the linear model. And what we are going to propose in this work is you train your neural network, you obtain some uh, weights theta tilde that you use to linearize the neural network to obtain a corresponding linear model. And then you are going to find the map uh, estimate of the weights in the linear model uh, separately. And you're going to use a different value of those weights. And you're going to use those map estimate, uh, that map estimate of the weights in the linear model in your expression for the model evidence. That's going to solve all the problems that I mentioned before. And it's going to lead to point estimates of the um, prior parameters that work much better in practice. So uh, we have this recommendation then we are going to train our neural network, find some point estimates of the weights, linearize the neural network, and then get some features for our, linear, for our linear model from that neural network. And then we are going to work with that linear model. We are going to do the Laplace approximation in the linear model by finding the map solution of the linear model. And then we are going to do hyperparameter tuning in that linear model, which makes sense because it's actually the model that we are using for making predictions. Um, the main change is that in our expression for the uh, model evidence, now instead of using uh, the point estimates for the weights of the neural network, the original neural network that we trained, we're going to use this theta star, which is going to be the map solution in the linear model. That's going to be a, a key change. In this work, we actually have an algorithm to do this optimization efficiently. Because the, to optimize the linear model, you need the features which are the gradients of the original network. And then you would have to do gradient-based optimization over those features. So you don't really want to do gradients of gradients, no? To, to do gradient-based optimization. And there is a way to obtain the gradients efficiently. And we have an algorithm for that in the, in the paper. I won't go into the details here. Uh, there is something that I didn't talk much about, uh, which is this Hessian. This Hessian also depends on the map solution in the linear model. But um, uh, I mean, it depends because, because of the way the, let me see if I have it here. The generalized Gauss-Newton matrix. If you look at the generalized Gauss-Newton matrix, these are the Jacobian features. That's fine. These are just the features given by the original neural network. But then you have this matrix G, and this matrix G is now the second derivatives of the log likelihood evaluated at the map solution. And this would be the, the I mean, sorry, the second derivatives of the log likelihood evaluated at the output of the neural network for the linear model. Uh, and this should be based on the map solution for the, uh, for the weights of the linear model. But actually that doesn't matter much. And uh, if you use just the, uh, the output of the original neural network, it's, it's fine. Uh, I, won't, I won't go much into the details of that because it's not really important. Uh, the key thing is that uh, when you evaluate the marginal likelihood uh, in this term that comes from the prior, here, in this term that comes from the, the prior, uh, you need to use the posterior mean of the linear model. If you do that, when you tune hyperparameters, you get this. And this gives you like nice uncertainty estimates that are actually better than the previous ones. The previous ones were too large. It was uh, overestimating uncertainty. Uh, and this looks uh, way much better. Uh, this maybe I can skip it. Uh, let's see how we are doing on time. Um, so here you look at the test uh, uh, log likelihood in a particular prediction problem using uh, David Mackay's original approach where the uh, marginal log likelihood is using the point estimates of the weights of the neural network. And you see that the uh, test negative log likelihood is way higher. And when you do it using our approach that is based on using uh, the map solution of the weights in the linear model, we get much better uh, results. 
So we are obtaining much better uncertainty estimates in this case. And uh, this is when you, the, the blue and the, the blue and the green is when you use this, this term of the Hessian, you leave it as in David Mackay's approach or you change it. And it does, that doesn't really matter much. It doesn't really matter changing it or not. So that's why I didn't describe it much. Uh, yeah, so this thing you don't care much, but you care about here, not using the theta tilde, which would be the point estimate of the, of the weights in the network, but using theta star, which would be the, the point estimates of the weights in the corresponding linear model. Uh, any questions on this so far? Yes. Yes. Uh, that's right. That's a good question. Uh, I think it doesn't really change much because the, the linear model, it's also quite good. Uh, I think we're using the original ones. We're using the original ones. Uh, you could think about using the, the point estimate of the linear model uh, and the, the, the results could be very similar. And there is one very good reason for that. And the reason is that this linear model is actually as good as the original linear neural network. The reason for that is that if you have a neural network with a fully connected layer, if you think about the Jacobian features for the weights in the last layer, those Jacobian features for the weights in the last layer are actually the activations of the last uh, layer in the network. So your linear model actually subsumes the original neural network. Your linear model is actually as good as the original neural network. Uh, and if you use that for making predictions, your predictions could be as accurate as well. Cool. Uh, so, I mean, the change is a small change, but it actually makes this approach works now with neural networks that uh, are not really fully optimized. Um, if you actually were able to train your neural network to convergence, where the gradients are actually zero, uh, you could show that uh, this theta star and theta tilde would be equivalent. But uh, that's not the case in practice. Uh, more things. There is something else with batch norm. If you use batch normalization, things could get quite wrong. Uh, and uh, in this work, we have some additional results show how to deal with batch normalization. And which, with networks, what happens is that usually you will have layers that implement batch normalization. And maybe you have an output layer that doesn't have batch norm. And that's going to create some conflict because you have some weights that are scale independent and some weights that are actually scale dependent. And if you train different prior variances on those weights, you're going to run into, into problems. Uh, maybe in the interest of time, I'm going to skip this. Uh, but I, I would say that the key thing is to have now different uh, prior variances for different layers that implement either batch norm or not batch norm. If you have, for example, layers that have batch norm and not batch norm, and you just train prior precisions, uh, the same prior precisions for those layers, things go wrong. And as you scale maybe some weights in batch norm, then the, the, the estimates of uncertainty that you get change quite a lot. Uh, just because some of the weights um, get uh, larger, and then your prior precision parameter will try to compensate for that. Uh, Again, maybe I won't go much into the details of this, but the idea is that now to have different prior variance, prior variance parameters per layer, uh, and when you do that, then uh, don't things don't change if you scale the weights. If you scale the weights, the which batch norm, the output of the network doesn't change, uh, and you wouldn't expect the uncertainties to change. And when you uh, have these different prior precisions per layer, the uh, Predictive uncertainty also doesn't change if you scale the weights by a constant k. That's kind of the message here. Uh, more things, we tried different architectures using our approach to choose the hyperparameters with this uh, theta star instead of theta tilde, and we do better in practice. And using, using multiple uh, prior precisions uh, for layers that use batch norm or not, then uh, things work better as well. Uh, so this uh, at, at least uh, gave us some uh, uh, solution to this problem of tuning uh, prior precision parameters using this marginal likelihood that was not working before. Uh, 
This is on a big neural network using these Kronecker factor approximations also uh, for Cypher. And again, we see some similar solutions that uh, using uh, this approach based on theta star and multiple lambdas works uh, better. Uh, good, maybe I'm going to skip Dust in the interest of time. I think we are, we have maybe five minutes. Uh, is there any questions so far? Maybe I can give you just a brief summary of, of the last thing that I'm not going to have to, time to, to describe in detail. You can use these techniques for image reconstruction. Uh, and this is for X-ray Im medical image. This is some work with Javier, Ricardo, Johannes, and Bankti. The idea is that you want to reconstruct uh, some section of an object with uh, some X-rays device. It's going, project, it's going to project the X-rays, and you get some uh, detection here. Uh, and in the end, this is a regression problem. You have some uh, uh, target values Y that you obtained through the machine. And there is a matrix A that determines how the, uh, the whatever is in the, in the way of the X-rays uh, transfer, transforms into a measurement at the end. So in the end, this, this is X would be the image. A is some uh, matrix given by the uh, machine that is making the measurements, and Y would be the measurements that you obtain. And uh, then the problem of uh, reconstructing the image from the measurements is just uh, solving this regression problem. Uh, the problem is typically underdetermined, under so the dimension of X is usually much higher than Y, and you need some prior assumptions here. Uh, what people use in practice that works quite well is something called the deep image prior. The deep image prior is just say, instead of optimizing over X directly, instead of optimizing over my image here directly, what I am going to have is some neural network that is going to have some weights and some input, and I'm going to optimize over this neural network. This neural network is going to be a convolutional, deconvolutional neural network. And it's going to introduce some uh, uh, bias in the optimization process that is going to favor the generation of uh, realistic images. So you are going to now optimize over the weights of the neural network and the input to the neural network instead of over X. You're going to minimize the reconstruction error and you're also going to introduce a regularizer called the total variation regularizer that penalizes the absolute value of nearby pixels. Uh, um, what we do is we get a Gaussian prior that has similar properties to this total variation regularizer. It introduces correlation between nearby pixels. I won't go much into the details of that. And then uh, we actually use this approach based on the deep image prior to reconstruct the image. But once we have reconstructed the image, we get uncertainty estimates using the Laplace approximation. So you train your unit to, recon to minimize the error, and the unit is going to generate an image. Then you are going to linearize this uh, network around the point estimate of the weights. We are going to then uh, put a Gaussian prior on the weights of the neural network, and then we are going to tune hyperparameters using the marginal likelihood using the techniques that I mentioned before. Uh, and uh, maybe, Shortly, uh, I can show some results. Yeah, this is the original image. It's a walnut. Actually, this is a section of a walnut. Um, you can see the point estimates that we obtained with the deep image prior uh, using just the standard techniques. And this is with dropout. The two images look kind of similar. The main difference is that dropout is maybe introducing more blurriness because it's trying to average over the, over the weights. Uh, our approach is just uh, using the point estimates of the, of the weights. No? So this is the same as a, a deterministic model, but then we can obtain uncertainty estimates here shown in this standard deviation. Uh, and we show that this standard deviation uh, values generated by our method are much closer to the actual errors of the model. Uh, especially in this region here in the left is like a section we see that these standard deviation values agree more with the errors. And when you look at the dropout model, the dropout model has these uncertainty estimates that are really bad. No, this doesn't really look at all like the errors of the model, uh, which is quite poor. Uh, 
you can look at the histograms of uh, errors in the model and standard deviation values. They look much better in our approach than with dropout and the calibration plot uh, also looks much better. Uh, so yeah, just to conclude, we can then take these neural networks that make very accurate point estimates and then uh, we can uh, linearize them, obtain a corresponding linear model, be Bayesian on this linear model and do hyperparameter tuning on the linear model to obtain better estimates. Uh, and that seems to be working quite well in practice. Uh, yeah, and that's all. Thanks uh, for everything.